It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the green mountains of Vermont. You know how people say they go into the woods for some peace and solitude? Well, I guess I'm not like most people. Me? I love a challenge, an off-the-grid trek through some wild territory. My name's Curtis Embry. Been hiking for as long as I can remember, and I've seen some seriously breathtaking trails in my time. Back then, I was working as a freelance photographer, traveling across the country to get my shots. It was a lifestyle suited to a bachelor like myself. But that trip to Vermont, that one was different. I set up camp at the foot of Stratton Mountain. It was still early spring, so snow clung to the higher peaks and the trails were mostly clear save for some slush. Just enough bite for a good walk, if you asked me. I packed a light bag, supplies for two days, and planned to stay at one of the mountain shelters overnight. The first day was mostly uneventful. Standard fare for seasoned hikers, some wildlife sightings, a bit of scrambling over steep sections. The trail wound up, up, and up past gnarled trees and icy little waterfalls hidden back in mossy crevices. That evening, I reached the shelter, a bare-bones wooden structure, and was delighted to find it empty. I ate, wrote in my journal, and settled in for a night on the hard wooden floor. Day two is where it gets sticky. I woke up to low clouds hanging over the mountain. The air was thick, damp, and somehow both too warm and too chilly for comfort. Visibility was poor, and I thought about turning back to base camp. That's common sense, right? But I figured a little mist never hurt nobody, and I wasn't the type to cut a trip short on account of weather. So I packed up, left a note in the shelter register like a good hiker should, and headed further along the trail. Things were quiet for a while, too quiet. No birds, no chipmunks. I didn't even hear my own boots scuffing through the dead leaves. Then came the smell. That's the first thing your senses pick up sometimes, even before your brain can process what's going on. And trust me, it wasn't the smell of pine needles or morning dew. It was a wet fur, rotten meat, kind of stench that makes the hair on your arms stand up. I stopped and strained to see through the fog. Did something die up ahead? Maybe a deer? I started to walk cautiously, searching for the source, part of me morbidly curious. That's when I saw it, a dark shape, massive, half obscured in the heavy mist. At first I couldn't make it out, but as it slowly moved it became clearer. It was standing on two legs— towering over the trees. Not a bear. Far too big, too gangly. I stood frozen, heart thumping like a rabbit caught in a snare. Then it turned its head. I only saw its face for a moment, but it was enough. This thing, creature, whatever it was, it wasn't natural. Its head was huge, misshapen, with a jaw full of jagged, needle-sharp teeth. Eyes that reflected the dull light. Eyes that were, well, not animal eyes. It growled, a guttural roar, and took a lumbering step towards me. That's when I snapped out of my shock. I turned and bolted, slipping on the damp ground and clambering down the trail. I could hear the creature crushing through the undergrowth behind me, its breath rasping in those massive lungs. The terrain was treacherous with the fog, but fear gave me some unnatural speed. I tripped, stumbled, my pack bouncing painfully against my back. Up ahead, through the trees, I saw a break in the fog the end of the tree lean. I sprinted for it, desperate to break free onto open ground. I burst onto a gravel clearing, and for a blissful, disorienting moment, everything was clear. The fog was clinging to the mountain behind me. Below, a road snaked its way through the valley, little cars zipping along. Civilization. 
A sudden surge of hope swelled up. Maybe I could run down to the road, flag a car down. My blood ran cold as I heard the thing break through the tree lean behind me. It stood there, at the edge of the fog, its grotesque form stark against the fading mist. We locked eyes, me and this monster, and I swear there was something cold and calculating in its gaze. Something that sent a shiver down my spine far worse than the creature's monstrous form. It didn't move, it just stood there, like it knew I was trapped. I backed away slowly. My brain was on fire, trying to assess my options. There was a sheer drop on one side of the clearing, thick woods on the other. The thing was blocking the trail I came up, and there was no way I could outrun it over open ground. A twig snapped behind me. I whirled around. There was another one. Same hulking shape, same eyes gleaming in the dissipating fog. They were surrounding me. I remember the wave of despair that washed over me in that moment. Hopelessness. It was a bitter thing to swallow, worse than the terror. I was going to die up here on that mountain, trapped between these creatures. Suddenly, from down on the road, a car horn blasted. The sound cut through the mountain stillness. One of the creatures twitched at the sound, turning away from me for a brief second. It was enough. I don't know what came over me, raw desperation, pure animal instinct, but I seized the moment. I turned and lunged toward the sheer drop, toward the thick tangle of woods below. Better a hard fall than whatever fate these things had in store for me. I heard a growl, a crashing sound as one of them moved after me, but I didn't look back. I threw myself over the edge. I hit the ground hard, then rolled, branches and thorns tearing at my clothes, the pack on my back barely cushioning the impact. I tumbled down, and down, the world spinning nauseatingly. Pain was the only constant, a sharp chorus in every limb. Then blackness engulfed me. When I came to, it was dusk. I was at the bottom of the ravine, miraculously in one piece but bruised and battered. My pack had vanished, and my legs throbbed in protest. I groaned, then stilled, heart hammering. I wasn't alone. Rustling echoed from the undergrowth, and those grotesque shapes emerged again, their eyes like burning embers in the gloom. I tried to back away, but only managed a pathetic scramble on the forest floor. One of them snarled, advancing with that unnervingly smooth, loping gait. I was trapped. There was nowhere to run, and even if I could stand, I wouldn't get far. But then, as the creature neared, poised to strike, a streak of white shot through the trees. Another figure, smaller than the creatures, collided with it, sending them both tumbling into the brush. A flurry of movement guttural growls, and a shriek that cut through the silent woodland pierced the air. I scrambled back. The newcomer, a woman dressed all in white, was fighting one of the creatures with an impossible ferocity. Her white clothes were stained with splashes of dark blood, hers, or the creature's, I couldn't tell. She held some sort of silver blade, and with a skill that bordered on supernatural, she managed to drive the creature back. There was a blinding flash, a smell of burning fur, and then the creature roared, turning and crashing away through the trees. Its companion, which had been circling warily, also vanished into the gloom. The woman stood there for a moment, the only sound her ragged breathing. Then she lowered her blade and turned towards me. In the failing light... I couldn't make out her face, only those fierce eyes. Can you move? she asked, her voice surprisingly strong for her slight frame. I gingerly tested my arms and legs. Everything hurt, but nothing seemed broken. Maybe. She nodded and moved with the agility of a wildcat, 
rummaging through the undergrowth until she unearthed my discarded pack. Tossing it to me, she said simply, Let's go. I stumbled to my feet and followed, two days for questions. She led me deeper into the woods, away from the ravine, her pace unyielding. There was an odd power radiating from her, a sense of purpose mixed with a deep, lingering sorrow. After an eternity of navigating fallen trees and thick ferns, a small, stone cottage appeared nestled in the trees. Its warm lights glowed through the windows. She stopped in front, pushing the door open with a weathered hand. You'll be safe here. I wanted to protest, to demand answers. But exhaustion won out, and I stumbled inside. She followed, quickly barricading the door behind us. The cottage was humble, barely more than a single room with a stone hearth and a scattering of old furniture. Herbs hung in bunches drying from the beams, and there was a faint scent of something vaguely medicinal in the air. Sit, she instructed me, pointing to a worn armchair. I sank into it, grateful for the softness against my bruises. She disappeared into a curtain-off alcove and emerged with a pot of steaming liquid and a cloth. This is for the pain, she explained, handing me a chip ceramic mug. It was a bitter, potent brew, but it eased the gnawing ache. She then turned her attention to dressing my cuts and scrapes, her movements swift and precise. As she tended my wounds, I stared at her. Her white garb, streaked with dirt and blood, was unlike anything I'd seen before a flowing dress with full sleeves, something almost medieval. Who, what were those things? My voice cracked from disuse. She hesitated, then met my gaze. There are many names for them. Demons, Wendigos, Shades. They are the shadows that haunt these old forests. They thirst for, well, let's just say your escape was very fortunate. And you? The word tumbled out, heavy with unspoken questions. A ghost of a smile twitched the corner of her mouth. I am called the White Watcher. I keep vigil here, keeping the darkness back from the rest of your world. I spent the rest of the night in that cottage, treated and fed by the cryptic, silent woman. I drifted in and out of fitful sleep, images of misshapen behemoths lurking in the fog haunting my dreams. Just before dawn, she woke me. You must leave this place, she urged. They will know you're here now, they'll return. She led me out into the pre-dawn chill and pointed me in the direction of a well-used trail. Follow this. It will take you down to the main road. Don't look back, don't return. And so I left. Battered but alive, I stumbled back to civilization, a shell-shocked survivor of an ordeal that defied explanation. The authorities questioned me, of course. They called my story a product of shock and exhaustion, labeled it a bear attack at worst. I let them. What else could I do? They chalked my scratches up to brambles, and that stench that clung to my memory, well, a dead animal nearby was a far more palatable explanation for them. In time, life went on, sort of. I never went back to the Green Mountains, never returned to the life of a wandering photographer. I couldn't even bring myself to pick up a camera again. The images of that day burned too brightly in my mind. The white watcher, the creatures that lurked in the mist, it felt like a fever dream, yet impossibly real. In the quiet hours, I wonder, do they still stalk the shadowed slopes of the mountain? Does the white watcher still stand guard against an encroaching darkness? And the creatures, the Wendigos, whatever they were, are they truly confined to that one wild place? Or do they lurk unseen in the shadows of every forest, waiting for the lost and the unwary?
The year was 2002, and I was finally exploring Olympic National Park in Washington State. I'd been a hiker all my life, drawn to lush greenery, the smell of rain-soaked pine needles, that kind of thing. But the Olympics, with its rainforests, coastal cliffs, it felt like a whole different world, more wild, more alive. My name's Kellen, by the way. I always hike solo. Something about the solitude keeps me grounded. Well, that and my little ritual, where I leave my phone back at the car. Feels a bit retro, I know, but there's something about truly disconnecting that appeals to me. My trip started out fantastic. Days spent scrambling across ancient fallen trees, spotting elk across misty valleys, even watching a gray whale off the coast. But it was the day I hiked Hurricane Ridge that things changed. Now, this trail isn't particularly remote, and the views from the ridge are so incredible there were other tourists around. Not enough to ruin the peace, but it was definitely a different vibe than my usual haunts. I was on my way back down, taking one of the more overgrown side trails for a change of scenery, when I first saw, well, I'm not sure what you'd call it. Something moving on another ridge, further along the trail. At first, I thought it was just a deer, its shape barely visible against the trees. Then, it stood up on two legs. Definitely not a deer. My heart skipped a beat. Was that a bear? It seemed too tall, too lean. Curiosity won out over my better judgment, and I pushed through the undergrowth towards the ridge, trying to find a better vantage point. I still didn't have a clear view, but I could see movement, deliberate, methodical. The figure was picking its way through the rocks and trees, not like an animal grazing, but like something focused on a path, a destination. There was a flash of something pale against the green as it passed through a clearing, and I got the sense it was looking straight back at me, even from that distance. A cold shiver went down my spine. People say things like, My blood ran cold, but I never really understood what that meant until that moment. For the first time, I considered the possibility this wasn't a hiker or an animal, but something else. Just your imagination playing tricks, Kellen, I told myself, hoping I sounded convincing. Still, instead of turning back the way I came, something morbidly compelling drew me forward. I followed the ridge as best I could, trying to keep a healthy distance, half wanting to see this figure up close, half terrified of what I might find. I kept tracking it for at least an hour, and the more I saw the less sense it made. Its shape was humanish, but elongated, its limbs like stilts as it picked its way across the rugged terrain with impossible speed. The face, when I finally got a glimpse of it between the branches, was off. Features too narrow, nose too flat, and its eyes, they shone with a strange silvery color in the late afternoon sun. By now, I'd completely forgotten the official trail. The setting sun cast long shadows, and the forest was taking on that eerie, dim quality as daylight started to fade. I decided the sensible thing was to head back towards the main path and get myself oriented again. This was a bad idea, Kellen, a very bad idea. Taking a shortcut down a steep embankment seemed like a good time saver at the time. It wasn't. My foot slipped on a moss-covered rock, and I went tumbling head over heels. The world blurred as I slammed into the ground, my gear scattering around me. I lay there groaning, trying to figure out which part of me wasn't screaming in pain. Then, from above me, came the laughter. It was high-pitched, chilling, and it sent every nerve in my body into overdrive. Slowly, I forced myself to sit up, scanning the slope for the source of the sound. Then I saw them. Not just the lanky creature from earlier, there were at least three more, all converging on my position. 
The palest one, the one I'd been tracking, was at the head of the group, its face fixed in a rictus grin that showed a whole lot of teeth. My pack was at least ten feet away, with my pocket knife inside. I started to scramble towards it, fighting panic rising in my throat. They moved faster. My fingers brushed the rough canvas of my bag, and then one of those elongated, clawed hands shot out and snatched it from under me. One of the creatures crouched down and started rifling through my stuff. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it was like a squabbling chorus of harsh rasps and clicks. My knife, my precious, idiot-proof pocket knife was in that pack. And these things, they weren't playing around. I lunged to my feet, propelled by sheer desperation. The one with my pack recoiled, hissing, but the others were on me in a flash. I felt nails rake my arm, and lashed out blindly, connecting with something hard. One of them was shrieking, and I saw a spray of dark liquid their blood. I didn't wait around to find out. I took off running, dodging and weaving through the trees as the enraged screeches chased me. The fading light was both a blessing and a curse, hiding me but also making it impossible to see where I was going. A branch snapped behind me, and I stumbled, barely catching myself on a tree root. I couldn't run forever. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew fighting back was my only chance. But with those claws and that eerie speed, the thought made bile rise in my throat. Finally, my foot snagged on something, and I went crashing down, hard. Pain ricocheted through my ankle, a bad sprain, or maybe even worse. Before I could even think of scrambling to my feet, a shadow fell over me. I looked up, heart pounding against my ribs. It was the lead creature the one with the unnerving silver eyes. It leaned closer, tilting its head to the side like a bird studying a worm. Then, in a voice that sounded like nails dragged across stone, it spoke a single word. Human! My jaw dropped. I'd been expecting snarls, grunts, the kind of noises a wild animal would make, not this chilling display of intelligence. The creature grinned, revealing rows of jagged teeth, far too numerous for a human mouth. We know you. It took a step closer, its gaze raking over my prone form. Watched you walk, watched you follow. Now we take. I scrambled backward, adrenaline masking the pain in my ankle. There was no point in pretending. They knew I'd been watching them. Take what? I managed to choke out, my voice barely above a whisper. For a moment, it seemed confused, almost amused by the question. Then, it gestured with a claw, pointing to the trail behind me, towards Hurricane Ridge. Suddenly, it all clicked. These weren't backwoods hermits, or some undiscovered feral tribe. These were the reason hikers went missing every year in these mountains— the reason for all those unexplained sightings. A surge of anger, fueled by terror, cut through the panic. You're the ones. The words died in my mouth as the thing laughed, a cruel sound that sliced through the quiet forest. Yes, it hissed, and I could see a predatory glint in its eyes. We take what we need, leave nothing behind. It took another step closer and I was sure this was it. I braced myself for the attack, the pain. But then it stopped, its head tilting again, as something caught its attention. Off in the distance, I heard voices. Shouting, getting closer. Other hikers, probably alerted by my panicked flight through the woods. The creature, no, the creature's leader, seemed to weigh its options. It darted forward, snatched my pack from the ground, and then with a flick of those spindly legs, it was up the nearest tree in a flash, disappearing into the foliage. The rest of them followed, their hisses cutting through the air as they vanished into the darkening canopy, 
leaving me alone on the ground, shaking, but alive. The hikers who found me weren't much help. They saw me sprawled next to a tree, bloody and rambling about monsters. I couldn't bring myself to say more, and they seemed happy enough to chalk it up to a bad fall and shock. The EMTs patched me up as best they could, and I spent a few days in a Port Angeles hospital with a badly broken ankle. It healed eventually, though there's a stiffness to it that will probably never go away. The whole time, I was just waiting. Waiting for the rangers to ask questions, for investigators to show up, something. But nothing happened. Nobody seemed particularly interested in the rantings of a solo hiker who'd fallen off a trail. And me? Well, I never told anyone the truth, not in any detail at least. Just enough to explain the injury and get a warning about rogue mountain lions put up on the park's website. Why? Part of me thought nobody would believe me, and the other part, well, maybe nobody should. I never went back to Olympic National Park, or hiked anywhere without packing some serious heat, both firearms and pepper spray. I still hike, but never alone, and I keep my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary, any movement that doesn't quite seem right. As far as I know, the attacks continued, random disappearances in wilderness areas, blamed on wildlife or plain bad luck. No evidence, nothing but the occasional story from a shaken survivor the authorities dismiss as delusional. But I know what's out there, those creatures with their silver eyes and their two sharp teeth. The locals have their stories about Sasquatches or Bigfoot. Maybe those stories have some truth to them. I think these things are different, though, cleverer, more malicious. Maybe a subspecies of hominids that took a very very wrong evolutionary turn. The scientists would have a field day, I'm sure. What I'm not sure about is why they let me live that day. Maybe they like playing with their food. Maybe they wanted a witness, a way to spread fear, to keep people away from their hunting grounds. Whatever the reason, I owe those hikers my life, even if they don't know what they saved me from. As for myself, my solitude is gone traded for the company of others, however much I might still yearn for it. Maybe that was the real price they took, the way those creatures win, not just by taking lives, but by changing the survivors forever. It was 1991. I'd finally convinced my wife, bless her heart, to let me drag her from city life for one long weekend of camping in the Pacific Northwest. She hates roughing it, but she knows better than to fight me when I get that wilderness itch. Name's Cal, by the way. Back then, I was working as a park ranger, so when I said we were going into the Olympics, I knew what I was doing. Or so I thought. We picked a trail up by the Elwa River, a scenic route that wasn't too challenging for beginners. The first couple of days were picture-perfect. Ancient trees, the river sparkling in the sun, the occasional deer sighting, it was like something out of a postcard. My wife even admitted she might not hate this whole nature thing as much as she thought. But then came the fog. That thick, wet coastal fog that rolls in and swallows the world whole. Now, any ranger worth their salt knows to play it safe with weather like that. But we were stubborn. I figured we'd just hole up in the tent until it blew over. Big mistake. By nightfall, we couldn't even see the trail ten feet in front of us. Thick condensation made everything slippery, like the forest itself was trying to trip and trap us. We were about to accept defeat and pitch our tent right there on the damp ground when I saw the cabin. It was just a faint outline at first, a dark shape breaking up the soupy whiteness. I wasn't sure if it was a trick of the eye, or if I was desperate enough to see it, 
but as we got closer, the shape coalesced into a real structure. An old trapper's cabin, maybe? It looked abandoned, but in that weather, it was a lifesaver. Cal, are you sure? My wife, Beth, was less enthusiastic. Turns out, spooky derelict cabins don't up your wife's enjoyment of the backcountry experience. Can't blame her, really. We pushed the door open. It creaked, and the sound echoed unnaturally in the damp fog. The inside was worse than I bargained for. Dust everywhere, the floor strewn with debris, the single window boarded up tight. Still, it was shelter for the night. We huddled together for warmth, trying to ignore the scratching noises coming from somewhere in the walls, trying to laugh about our misadventure. But that gnawing sense of unease never left, like we were being watched. Turns out we were. Sometime in the middle of the night, I jolted awake. Something had changed. It took me a moment to realize the fog. It was thinner inside the cabin, swirling around us in strange patterns, almost like the currents underwater. And in those swirling mists I saw it. A face. Not human, at least not completely. It was too long, too wide, with eyes that glowed a startling shade of amber, like a cat's eyes magnified tenfold. The mouth looked wrong, stretched into this horrible, mocking grin that displayed way too many needle-like teeth. I fumbled for my flashlight, the one I'd been stupid enough to leave in my pack, but even as I grabbed it, the creature was gone. Cal, hey, wake up. Did you hear that? Beth was shaking me, her voice a frightened whisper. There's something out there, I heard it. We lay there, listening to the muffled sounds coming from outside the cabin. Footsteps, soft and muffled, circling the structure. A guttural snarl that made the hair on our necks stand on end. And worse, the laughter high-pitched and cruel, like it was mocking our fear. Oh God, Cal, what is it? Beth was trembling like a leaf, but she was braver than me in that moment. I wished I could tell her there was nothing to worry about, that it was just a wild animal driven desperate by the storm. But those eyes, they looked intelligent, filled with cold malice. It wanted us. I could feel it. I thought back to some of the things the old-timers at the ranger station used to whisper about, legends of the whole rainforest, of things that stalked the deep woods that weren't in any guidebook. I'd always laugh them off. Not anymore. The thing started slamming against the walls, trying to find a way in. The rotten wood groaned in protest. I grabbed my hunting knife, not that it'd do much good against whatever was out there. I knew we couldn't stay in the cabin. It was just a matter of time before the creature found a way in. The fog had thinned outside, offering maybe enough visibility to escape. Grabbing Beth's hand, I made a run for the door, and slammed straight into someone standing right outside. It was tall, at least seven feet if not more, and built all wrong, limbs impossibly long, ending in clawed hands that twitched and twitched with unnatural eagerness. It hissed as the beam of my flashlight caught its face, the amber eyes flashing in the darkness. The stench coming off the creature nearly knocked me back. It wasn't animal musk or even the rotting flesh scent you'd expect from a scavenger. This was something fouler, a decay that reached into your soul, not just your senses. Get behind me! I yelled at Beth. She clung to my arm, her knuckles turning white under the flashlight beam. The creature cocked its head. It moved with unsettling grace almost dancing in place. When it spoke, I had to swallow a wave of nausea. The voice was guttural, layered with growls and hisses, and yet it carried the same mocking amusement as the laughter. Outsiders, come to play hunter's games? It took a step closer, forcing me backwards, claws brushing against my face. 
so many years, so little meat. I was barely holding back a scream of my own. My hunting knife, meant to fend off bears or mountain lions, felt like a pathetic toy in the face of this thing. Who was I kidding? We were trapped, cornered by something that wasn't part of the natural order. Let us go. I managed, my voice a pathetic squeak. We don't want any trouble. The creature threw back its head and laughed, the sound harsh enough to hurt. Trouble, oh little hunter, trouble is why I exist. Bess shrieked. On the ground, where my flashlight beam danced, more shapes were coalescing from the fog. Not one creature, but at least three others, identical in their horrific wrongness. Each moved with the same disturbing speed, and there was hunger in those glowing amber eyes. We were surrounded. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out everything but the sound of their rasping breath and my wife's terrified sobs. This was it. This is where I screwed up badly enough to get us both killed. It lunged, not the creature I'd been facing but one I hadn't noticed crouched to the side. Beth pushed me out of the way, just barely, and it snatched at the empty air where I'd been standing a moment before. A burst of instinct, a sliver of wild hope cut through the terror. Run, Beth, run! I didn't need to tell her twice. She bolted towards the tree line where the fog was thickest. The creatures shrieked in protest, their eyes flicking from the fleeing prey to me, their new quarry. My plan, if you could even call it that, was simple, by her time. Every second she gained was another second towards safety, towards help, towards escape from this nightmare. My knife was useless, a toothpick against those claws. It wouldn't kill them, I knew that now, but maybe it would hurt. Maybe it would enrage them enough to keep them focused on me. One of them came for me a blur of sinewy limbs and gaping maw. I dodged, more by luck than skill, and my blade found its mark. It shrieked, the sound piercing, and a burst of foul-smelling, yellow-green liquid sprayed onto my arm. I gagged, fighting the urge to vomit. The other two were closing in now. They toyed with me, fainting attacks, slashing at my skin and clothes. Each cut burned like acid, sending waves of agony through my body. But I had to keep moving, keep them distracted. Through a haze of pain, I saw Beth reach the trees. It looked like she was making it, vanishing into that silvery fog. A flicker of hope fought through the despair. Then she screamed. One of the creatures darted after her, disappearing into the grayness. The last of my courage shattered. I roared, a desperate sound born of grief and fury, and charged at the remaining monster. We collided in a flurry of tangled limbs, raking claws, and sickening growls. I felt the bite of its teeth on my shoulder, but somehow I managed to slam my knife into one of those glowing eyes. It let out a shriek that seemed to split the very air and staggered backwards, clutching its ruined face. Seizing my chance, I broke free, running blindly towards the trees. I didn't know if Beth had escaped, but I had to try, had to live long enough to find out. Behind me, I could hear the creature in pursuit, still alive despite its wound. But the fog was my ally now, swallowing me up, masking my path. Branches lashed at my face, stones slipped under my feet, but I kept going, fueled by adrenaline and the desperate need to get out, to find help, to avenge Beth if I was too late. I don't know how long I ran. Finally, I burst through the fog and back into what passed for daylight in those rain-soaked woods. I stumbled onto the trail, not caring anymore if I was headed the right way. My only thought was finding civilization, finding someone to report this horror. They found me near the park entrance, collapsed and delirious, muttering about monsters. 
It took months of recovery, both physical and mental, before I could even string together a story the authorities believed. Of course, no sign of Beth or the cabin, nothing to support my wild claims. Just a ranger, injured, with a missing wife and a fantastical tale. It's years later now. The nightmares still come, the smell of putrid decay, the glowing eyes in the darkness. Some nights I still wake up screaming. Most folks just smile politely, write it off as PTSD or a delayed breakdown caused by the trauma. Even I question it sometimes. Maybe the fog, the fear, caused hallucinations. But deep down, I know what I saw. Call them legends, call them whatever your rational mind needs. Some parts of the world, thank God, are still untouched by so-called civilization. In those places, old things walk things the guidebooks don't tell you about. I call them rake skin, an old backcountry term nobody remembers but me. It fits, I think, for monsters that wear the night like their own skin. I've never returned to the Olympics and I never will. Beth, sometimes I still imagine her out there, somehow alive, somehow fighting back against those things. Keeps me going, knowing maybe, just maybe, there's still a chance for her, even if there isn't for me. The summer of 1995 found me exploring the vast wilderness of Yosemite National Park. You wanna talk iconic? This place had it all, towering waterfalls, granite cliffs, giant sequoia trees. Even a seasoned hiker like me gets awestruck somewhere like that. My name's Randall Pace, but most folks just call me Pace. I'm a bit of a nature buff, an avid hiker. And back then, a grad student needing a break from the hustle and bustle of university life. I chose a route off the beaten track that promised fewer crowds and wilder vistas. It meandered through the Tuolumne Meadows area, cutting alongside the Dana Fork of the Tuolumne River. The first couple of days were pure bliss. Crystal clear streams, crisp mountain air, the kind of solitude that makes you remember what breathing feels like. It was textbook backpacking, nothing to write home about except, maybe, a postcard of half dome to make my folks jealous. The trouble started on the third day. I was well into the trail, pushing through a thick grove of red firs and pines when the smell hit me. It wasn't the natural scent of the forest. No, this was rank rotting meat mixed with something oily and burnt. It was enough to make your stomach heave. A bare carcass, maybe? Or maybe something had killed a deer and was dragging the body off. I stopped, scanned the trees, that sense of unease prickling the back of my neck. I'm no stranger to wildlife. I've crossed paths with mountain lions and even the odd grumpy bear on my hikes and I've always managed to keep my cool. But this? This felt different, wrong. Against my better judgment, curiosity took over. I followed the stench, venturing off the trail into a shadowy tangle of trees. As I moved deeper in, I got an uneasy feeling like I was stepping into a place where I didn't belong. And that's when I found it. A clearing, littered with things, it took me a moment to process what I was seeing. Bones, stripped clean of flesh, scattered like some morbid jigsaw puzzle. Rags of tattered clothing, faded and stained a disturbing shade of brown. And worse, a campsite. A tent, ripped to shreds. Backpack, torn open, contents strewn about. Everything splattered with dark, dried blood. I don't know what I was expecting, maybe a bear's leavings, some poor hiker who'd stumbled into the wrong path. But this, this looked almost deliberate, calculated. Then I heard it, a rustling from the trees on the far side of the clearing. 
My heart pounded in my ears. Adrenaline flooded my system as I reached for the hunting knife strapped to my belt. A figure stepped into view. My first thought was, homeless guy. But as it moved closer, I realized how wrong I was. This thing was enormous, easily topping seven feet tall. Its body was gaunt, emaciated, and it moved in a jerky, unnatural way. Its skin had a greenish-gray pallor, stretched too tight across its protruding bones. And the head. I'd never seen anything like it. Too elongated, with a narrow, almost skeletal jaw that jutted out at a sickening angle. Its eyes. God, those eyes. Empty black pits that stared out from a face devoid of any humanity. This wasn't natural. This was pure nightmare fuel. Whatever it was, it wasn't an animal. And definitely not human, not anymore. I froze, unsure of whether to run or try to fight. The thing twitched, turning its attention towards the shredded remains of the campsite. It let out a low, rasping sound that made the hairs on my arms stand up. It then began to feed there's no nice way to say it. It tore at the remnants of clothing and ripped into whatever meat remained with its long, bony fingers. The sound was horrifying, a wet, sickening crunch, accompanied by growling and guttural snarls. I couldn't take it. My backpack was still at the edge of the clearing. I took a slow, cautious step back, keeping my eyes fixed on the monstrous creature. It ignored me, completely focused on its grisly meal. Another step, then another. Then, something changed. The creature froze, its head jerking upright. Those pit-black eyes locked onto mine. It dropped what it was holding, the noise vanishing abruptly. I tensed, the knife gripped tightly in my hand. A long, tense moment passed. Then... With a fluidity that defied its skeletal form, it lunged at me. I screamed, more out of shock than anything else. I ran. Blind, desperate flight through the trees. I could hear the creature tearing through the undergrowth behind me, its rasping breath echoing in the woods. Branches whipped at my face, my boots pounded relentlessly against the forest floor. A cliff loomed into view, a sheer drop into a narrow ravine. I didn't see another option. It was either that or face whatever that thing was. I took a breath and jumped. I hit the ground hard, gasping. I could taste blood in my mouth and a sickening wave of nausea churned in my stomach. The thing hadn't followed me, thank God, but the ravine meant I was trapped. Pain flared in my ankle a nasty sprain, maybe worse. I sat there, huddled behind a rock, trying to think, trying to form a plan. I had to get out of there, find help. But how? My only hope was to climb back up that damn cliff. It looked impossible, but what choice did I have? With a grimace, I tested my ankle. It was painful, but I could put some weight on it. Using fallen branches for support, I began the agonizing climb back up. Each pull, each inch gained, felt like torture. My hands were torn raw, my breath ragged, but fear spurred me on. When I finally reached the top, the sun was dipping towards the horizon. Exhausted and injured, I still didn't dare stop. I had to warn people, tell someone what I'd seen back there. I stumbled along the edge of the cliff, desperately seeking a trail. Suddenly, a flicker of movement caught my eye. A figure, a man, standing amidst the trees a short distance away. Hey! I tried to call out, but my voice cracked, barely a whisper. I waved my arms, summoning what little strength I had left. The man turned. At first... I saw only his dark silhouette against the fading light. Then he stepped forward, and the details of his appearance snapped into focus. 
a thick, unkempt beard, ragged clothes that looked more like animal skins than anything bought in a store, and most striking of all, his eyes. They were sunken and wild, with a gleam of something both calculating and desperate. I should have felt relieved. A human being at last. But something about this man set me on edge. He was different, feral. A mountain man, perhaps? A hermit who'd gone off the deep end. Are you, are you okay? My voice shook more than I liked to admit. He said nothing, just stood there, watching. I saw him glance towards the cliff's edge, then back at me. It hit me then a sickening certainty. He knew about the creature, maybe he'd even seen it himself. Perhaps that's why he was out here, so far off the trails, so isolated. His gaze drifted down to the knife still clutched in my hand. I realized then just how dangerous he could be, how little help I could expect. This was my fight now, my problem. Thanks, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. I'll be fine. I started backing away, my injured ankle throbbing. He didn't move, didn't speak, just watched me go. I hobbled for what felt like hours, ignoring the gnawing pain and growing darkness. Panic threatened to swallow me, but I fought it back. I had a vague memory of where the main trail was, a sense of direction, and just a sliver of hope. When I finally broke out of the woods and onto the dirt path, it was full dark. And then, a miracle. Headlights swept across the trail, a truck, an old and beat-up thing, rumbling along. I waved frantically, screaming and limping out into the beam. The truck screeched to a halt. I don't remember much about the ride to the ranger station. The concerned face of an older woman a park volunteer, swimming in and out of focus. There were blankets, the warmth spreading through my chilled body, a sip of something hot and sweet. Then the chaos. Rangers swarming the area, a search party, questions about the campsite, about the creature I'd seen. I told them everything, or as much as I could recall through the haze of exhaustion and pain. About the man I'd met, too, they exchanged grim looks, and I knew it wasn't the first disturbing thing they'd heard. The aftermath was a whirlwind of park closures, investigations that seemed to go nowhere. My description of the creature was met with skepticism or vague denials. Yet I saw it in their eyes, the recognition, the unspoken belief that this wasn't something that could be easily explained away. The campsite was never found. The man I'd seen in the clearing? He disappeared back into the wilderness. They called me lucky. I don't know if I believe them. I never went back to Yosemite. I still hike, but it's different now. There's a shadow over every trail, a prickle of unease that never goes away. Part of me knows I never will outrun what I saw in that forest. The creature? Some say I hallucinated the whole thing, a product of shock and a close brush with death. Others claim there are things out there that the maps don't show, creatures that slip through the cracks of the known world. As for me, I've learned a hard lesson. Just because we don't understand something, doesn't mean it isn't real. Maybe it's a Bigfoot, maybe a Wendigo, or something far worse that we barely have names for. Regardless of what it was, I know this. There's darkness in those woods, and it's best left undisturbed. The year was 1978, and I was deep in the heart of Yellowstone National Park. Always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, me. Not content with the usual tourist trails, I craved the raw wilderness, the kind of places where you could go days without seeing another soul. Call me reckless, call me an idiot, 
but I felt most alive when I was out there, pushing my own limits. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt Lawson. I'd been on a solo backpacking trip for almost a week rugged terrain, thick pine forests, and those steaming geothermal pools that Yellowstone is famous for. On this particular day, I was hiking along a narrow ridgeline, heading towards a peak with a view I knew would knock my socks off. The trail wound along the crest of the ridge, sharp drop-offs on either side. That morning, a heavy fog had rolled in, obscuring the trail in places and adding an eerie cast to the landscape. I wasn't too worried. It would burn off later in the day, or so I hoped. It was that damn fog that led me to stumble upon something I wish I hadn't. An offshoot of the trail, barely visible, disappearing into the thick mist. Now, in hindsight, my biggest mistake was following it. The path led me into a narrow, shadowed gully. The surrounding hillsides muffled the usual forest sounds, creating a strange, deadened silence that made the skin on the back of my neck prickle. The air smelled damp, musty. Suddenly, a rustle. A loud snapping of branches from further within the gully. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, my voice sounding unnaturally loud in the quiet. Nothing. I edged further in, every instinct screaming at me to turn around. That's when I saw it. An old cabin, half hidden amongst the trees and rocks. Wood planked, with a sagging roof and broken windows, it looked like it had been abandoned for decades. Then again, this far off the beaten track, who knows what you might find. Something flickered out one of those busted-out windows. My skin crawled. I knew I should get out of there, back to the ridge trail, but curiosity was my Achilles' heel. I approached the cabin cautiously. As I got closer, something about it felt off. Not just the decay, but a sense of wrongness, of something rotten festering beneath the surface. My hand hovered over the old, rusted doorknob. I hesitated, then, gripped by a perverse sort of fascination, I pushed open the door. It creaked on its hinges, the sound echoing through the deathly silence of the gully. The interior was even worse than I'd expected. Dark, dirt-caked floors, bits of moldy furniture rotting away in the corners. It reeked of wet wood and something worse, a rancid, coppery smell that made my stomach churn. And then, there was a sound I'll never forget. A low, guttural growl that seemed to come from the very walls of the cabin. I spun around, heart pounding in my ears. A hulking figure stood silhouetted in the shadows at the back of the room. It took a lumbering step forward, and I finally saw it clearly. The thing was enormous, easily over seven feet tall. Its body was lean, almost skeletal, with taut, leathery skin stretched over protruding bones. Its face. God, its face. It was gaunt, with a sharp, elongated jaw and eyes that burned like hot coals in the dim light. Not an animal, not exactly. But not fully human either. As it moved closer, I saw its hands were tipped with long, yellowed claws, and its teeth. They were sharp, too many, like some monstrous predator. This wasn't a sick bear or a hermit. This was something else entirely. A surge of adrenaline blasted through me, overriding the shock. I fumbled for the hunting knife strapped to my belt. The creature hissed, baring those terrible teeth. It lunged, its movement impossibly fast for something so ungainly. I barely managed to dodge its claws stumbling back. My pack. I'd left it by the door. I needed to get to it, to the gun I kept inside for emergencies. I bolted towards the door, the creature loping after me. I heard it snarling, felt its foul breath on the back of my neck. Reaching the doorway... I flung my pack towards the creature, half hoping it might distract it. 
I tore out into the mists back towards the ridge. The fog closed in like a smothering blanket, making it hard to tell where I was going. I ran blindly, stumbling over roots and rocks, the creatures grunting gaining on me. It knew this terrain far better than I did. The mist was playing tricks, too was that the ridge ahead, or just another cruel mirage. A flicker of movement caught my eye. A figure, tall and thin, stepping out from the fog. For a wild moment, I thought, rescue. But as the figure moved closer, a fresh wave of terror washed over me. This one, its skin was an unhealthy gray, stretched tight over a distended belly. Its mouth hung open, slack-jawed, and its eyes, sunken deep in its skull, seemed to bore right through me. I'd escaped one monster, only to stumble upon another. Two of them. They circled me, guttural growls rumbling in their throats, the sound echoing through the fog. My knees started to buckle. I knew there was no way out. Whatever these things were, they were hungry, and I was their prey. I thought of the gun in my pack, now surely torn apart by the first creature in the cabin. Even if I'd had it, what chance did bullets have against these abominations? I raised the knife in a pathetic gesture of resistance. As the two creatures closed in, I expected pain, the tearing of flesh. Instead, there was a sudden, piercing screech that split the air. Both creatures froze mid-stride. They whipped their heads around, searching for the source of the sound. A third figure emerged from the fog. A woman, dressed all in white, a long, flowing robe stained with dirt and blood. She was slender, but moved with a strength that belied her frame. In her hand she held a gleaming silver dagger. The creatures snarled, circling her warily but with a tremor in their movements like dogs sensing a dominant force. The woman's eyes, sharp and fierce, never left them. Be gone, she commanded, her voice surprisingly clear and strong despite her slight form. Leave this place. There is no more for you here. The creature with the taut skin let out an ear-splitting shriek, a sound that seemed filled with both fear and rage. It lunged at the woman, but she moved with incredible speed, dodging its clumsy attack and slashing at it with the dagger. There was a blinding flash of light, a smell of burning hair, and the creature howled in pain, scrambling away into the fog. Its companion hesitated for a moment, then vanished back into the grayness. The woman turned to me. Can you move? she asked, her voice softening. I could only nod, still too shocked to speak. She tossed me what was left of my pack and motioned for me to follow. I didn't question her, just stumbled along, dazed, barely registering the path we took. Finally, we emerged from the dense fog back onto the ridge trail. You're safe now, she said, her voice calmer. Follow this trail to the main road. Don't look back. She turned and disappeared back into the mist, as suddenly as she'd appeared. I wanted to call after her, to ask questions, but something in her demeanor, a sense of ancient purpose, kept my tongue tied. By the time I reached the ranger station, I'd regained enough of my wits to know that telling the truth would land me in a padded cell. I spun a story about a bear attack, showed them my torn-up pack as evidence— they bought it, though I saw suspicion in the eyes of one older ranger. Word travels fast in a place like Yellowstone. Soon, I heard hushed whispers about unusual animal sightings, of a strange woman seen lurking in the fog. But my story remained just that, a story. The creatures, the cabin, it all faded into the realm of half-remembered nightmares. Yet something shifted in me. The wilderness I'd once sought thrills and now held a lingering darkness. Eventually, I left that life behind entirely. Took up a quiet job in a bookstore, 
found solace in the printed word rather than the unpredictable world outside. But on foggy days I can still feel their eyes on me, hot and predatory. The creatures in the gully, were they some isolated offshoot of humanity, driven mad and monstrous by solitude? Were they remnants of an older, crueler world that lurks just beneath the surface of our own? Or perhaps, like the woman in white, they are something else entirely. A force neither wholly good nor evil, playing out a battle just beyond our perception. I still think of her, sometimes. The woman who appeared from nowhere and saved my life. Who was she? And why did she seem so burdened, like she carried a terrible, ancient weight upon her shoulders? I'll never know the answers, and maybe it's for the best. There are some shadows you're better off not chasing. Some mysteries are better left untouched. I suppose the creature in that cabin was a type of ghoul, or a wendigo of some sort. But the truth? Well, the truth is forever bound up with those swirling mists and the echoing silence of that forgotten gully. It was early 1988 when I told my buddies I was going back out to the Superstition Mountains. You know, the ones out in Arizona folks whisper about. Where the lost Dutchman's gold mine is supposed to be buried? I'd been out there before, just some fun weekend hikes that went smooth as butter. This time, though, I was going deeper, setting up base camp for a week of pushing further into the wilderness. Wanted a real adventure, you know? Figured this would be the one. My name's Harlan, by the way. Harlan Tucker. I was in my late thirties back then, fit enough, did a lot of climbing at the gym and had the gear dialed in. Thought I was ready for anything those mountains could throw at me. That first day out on the Peralta Trail was beautiful, straight out of a postcard. Clear blue skies, the reddish rocks glowing in the sun, scent of sage in the air. Kept reminding myself to stay hydrated, even in January, the desert sun ain't no joke. I stopped for lunch a few hours in, found a nice flat rock with a view out across this wide sandy wash, and munched on trail mix. The silence was something else. No cars, no planes, no people, just the wind whistling around the rocks. After a while, I noticed something out of place in that wash. A heap of clothes, it looked like, all faded and weathered, piled up at the base of some big boulders. Got curious, decided to go check it out. As I got closer, something about those clothes sent a cold shiver down my spine. They weren't just old, they were ancient. Like maybe belonged to one of those prospectors who disappeared out here back in the 1800s. And what made my stomach drop was the dark stains spattered across the tattered remains of a shirt. Dried blood, maybe? The whole thing just stank of wrongness. I backed away, heart thumping. Told myself it was just someone fooling around, some Halloween leftovers dumped out there. But deep down, I felt an unease I couldn't shake. The next few days went by just fine. I saw more of the superstitions than most folks ever do, traipsing through canyons and finding hidden waterfalls. Saw some bobcats and javelinas, too. But that pile of clothes wouldn't leave my head. Kept thinking maybe there were bones out there, someone who never got found despite all the years of searching. So, on day four, I found myself drawn back to the wash. I couldn't explain it just felt this urge to check it out one more time. The closer I got, the more the hairs on my neck stood up. Whatever had happened there, whatever those bloody clothes meant, I knew it wasn't good. I circled around the boulders slowly, half expecting to stumble on a skeleton. What I found instead made me freeze in my tracks. The clothes were gone. Fresh footprints marked the sand, 
leading away from the rocks. Not human footprints, mind you. These were big, with claws bigger than any mountain lion I'd ever seen. Whatever made them was walking on two legs, heavy steps thudding through the sand as it disappeared into a narrow crevice between the boulders. And that's when I saw the cave. Hidden behind some scrubby brush, the opening was low and shadowed. A whiff of something foul wafted out that rotten, coppery smell of old blood. My throat tightened. Had whatever beast left those tracks dragged its prey back here? Was there something alive in there? Part of me wanted to run like hell, the smart part. But another part, the foolish part, I guess, it wouldn't let me. I crept closer, my hand tightening on the survival knife at my belt, then stopped at the edge of the darkness. There was a sound from within, a rhythmic rasping. Like something big was breathing in there. My knees felt like water, but I couldn't make myself back away. I reached into my pack and fumbled for my flashlight. Flicked it on. And then I saw it. I wish I hadn't. The creature was hunched in the shadows, its back to me at first. It was human-sized, maybe bigger. I saw wiry limbs ending in sharp claws, ragged patches of fur clinging to grayish skin stretched tight over bone. It was emaciated, starved, and then it turned slowly. Its eyes were the worst. Huge, round, and sunk deep in their sockets, glowing a sickly yellow. Its jaw hung slack, dripping some thick black drool, revealing a maw of jagged teeth, way too many teeth. It hissed, a sound like fingernails on a chalkboard, and lurched towards me. I screamed, stumbled back, and the flashlight tumbled from my hand. The ground rushed up at me as I fell, scrabbling for my knife. The impact left me dazed. My knife was gone, flung somewhere into the sand. The creature was on me in seconds, its claws ripping through my backpack, my clothes, my skin. I kicked and thrashed, a desperate animal, but it was far too strong its stench overwhelming me. I caught another glimpse of those terrible eyes, full of feral hunger, before it lunged for my face. I braced for the killing blow, and then I heard a gunshot. The creature jerked away from me, a startled snarl ripping from its throat. I scrambled upright just in time to see a man cresting the top of the boulders, a rifle cradled in his arms. Get out of here! the man yelled. He was older, maybe with leathery skin and a thick gray mustache. Wore one of those old-school cowboy hats, too. He fired another shot, and this time the bullet struck home. The creature yelped, a blackish spray erupting from its shoulder, and stumbled back toward the cave entrance. I didn't wait for a third shot. I ran, heart pounding like a drum, back the way I had come. I could hear the creature snarling behind me, the man cursing, another gunshot echoing through the wash, but I didn't dare look back. I sprinted until my lungs burned. When I finally collapsed behind a rock, gasping for breath, there was only silence. I stayed there, hidden for hours, until the desert sun dipped low and the shadows began to creep out across the sand. The old man found me near sundown, rifle slung over his shoulder. He knelt beside me, offered a canteen of water, and waited patiently while I composed myself. Name Silas, he said finally, his voice gravelly but not unkind. What were you doing out here messing around with that thing? Between ragged breaths, I told him about the clothes, the tracks, and my horrifying discovery. I told him everything except why I'd been out there in the first place, trying to find treasure, getting myself mixed up in something I couldn't even comprehend. Silas didn't judge me. He just nodded, listening. When I was done, he took a swig of water and said, That thing ain't human. Never was. 
We call em skinwalkers around here. Devilish things. My blood ran cold. I'd heard the stories before, of course. Navajo legends, campfire tales. But I never believed they were real. Not until that moment. We'd been keeping an eye on it. Silas continued. Ever since it started snatching cattle. Had to do something for it got a taste for folks. Reckon you owe me your life, son. I did owe him, that was for sure. He helped me bandage my wounds as best he could and led me back to his truck, parked a ways off. The hike back to civilization was agonizing, both from my injuries and the knowledge of what lurked in those mountains. But we made it. In the aftermath, I lied to everyone told the rangers I'd been attacked by a rabid coyote, that I'd barely escaped. They looked at me like I was crazy, but I didn't care. I didn't file a missing person report on those clothes I'd found either, just left them and whatever story they held out there in the desert. It took months for my wounds to heal, and longer still for the nightmares to fade. I never went back to the superstitions, of course. Heck, I barely even go hiking anymore. That year changed me. Sometimes, late at night, I still think about that creature. About Silas, out there all alone, keeping watch over those mountains. And about how easily I could have become just another faded pile of clothes, another disappearance swallowed up by the desert. They say the lost Dutchman's gold is cursed that those who seek it pay a terrible price. Maybe that's true, but out there, there's something far worse than a curse. There's a hunger in those mountains, and if you're not careful, it'll claim you, body and soul. Some treasures are better left buried. The year was 1978, and I was 21, fresh out of college and ready to see the world. Or, well, at least the American West. Hitched a ride out to Glacier National Park in Montana with a buddy from Wyoming. Figured it was the perfect place to spend a summer hiking and camping. We'd only been there a few days when my friend, Travis, got called back home for some family emergency. Since I'd bought all the gear for a solo adventure anyway, I decided to stay and explore on my own. Name's Jonah, Jonah Walker. Always preferred the quiet of the woods to the noise of crowds, you know? Had a little route mapped out, a nice three-day loop out along the Gunsight Pass Trail, nothing too strenuous. That first day was picture-perfect. Clear skies, fresh air, the kind of scenery that makes you remember just how small you are in the grand scheme of things. Glaciers got it all, towering peaks, waterfalls, wildflowers blooming in the meadows. You feel lucky just to be there. Found the perfect campsite right near a little tarn, set up my tent, and made dinner while the sun dipped behind the mountains. Night fell quickly in those deep woods, the stars coming out bright as diamonds. I fell asleep easy, the gentle lapping of water on the shore almost like a lullaby. And that's when the trouble started. I woke up with a jolt, heart pounding, sure that something was wrong. Lay there frozen for a minute, listening. The forest was dead quiet, but something was prickling at the back of my neck. An animal sniffing around the tent, maybe? My hand fumbled for my flashlight. As I flicked it on, a ragged gasp caught in my throat. A pair of glowing eyes stared back at me through the mesh of the tent, right outside my face. Now, I'd seen critters around camp before, raccoons, squirrels, that sort of thing. But this, this was something else entirely. Those eyes, they were huge, yellow, and slanted up at the sides like a cat's. But wrong twisted somehow, and they were set in this long, pale, hairless face. 
I yelled, scrambling backwards, knocking over my camp chair. The eyes vanished, and I heard something crashing through the brush, moving away fast. It was on two legs, whatever it was, judging by the way the branches snapped. Lay there shaking for what felt like hours, unable to will myself back out of the tent. When dawn finally broke, I cautiously crawled out, half expecting to find some mangled, half-eaten animal carcass nearby. But there was nothing. No tracks, no blood, no sign that anything out of the ordinary had happened at all. Told myself it was just a nightmare, that the stress of being alone had messed with my head. Packed up my gear in a hurry and hightailed it back to the trailhead, determined to put the whole thing behind me. It wasn't until later that afternoon, stopping for a bite at a diner on the edge of the park, that I overheard some other hikers talking. Something got another one. An older woman with a weathered face was saying, Up near Bowman Lake, they say. Snatched him right out of his tent in the night, just vanished. I froze, the blood draining from my face. Those rangers don't know what to make of it. Someone else chimed in. Tracks been showing up all over the place, not like any animal prints they ever seen. Some folks saying it's Bigfoot, others think it's something worse. The rest of their conversation washed over me, the words muffled in my ears. I'd seen the face of what was out there hunting folks in the night. Snatched? Just vanished? That could have been me. I paid for my untouched food and stumbled out of there as fast as I could. Never even looked back at Glacier, just got in my car and drove. And now, the nightmares come. I see those eyes again, that twisted, hungry face. And I hear the snap of branches, and the rhythmic thud of something heavy approaching through the darkness. Maybe it was some kind of unknown critter, some undiscovered species. Maybe it was something that ain't supposed to exist at all. But whatever it was, I know this. There's things out there in the wild places, things we don't understand. And sometimes, they come looking for us. A twig cracked behind me. I whipped around, hand fumbling at my waist for the pistol I now always carried on hikes, heart pounding like a rabbit in a snare. But it was nothing just a squirrel rustling through the leaves. I holstered the gun, trying to calm my racing breath. Ever since that night in Glacier, I'd been jumpy, every creak and rustle setting my teeth on edge. Took a few more wary steps down the trail, then stopped in my tracks up ahead, blocking the path, stood an old cedar tree. And carved into its trunk was a symbol. Two crude circles stacked on top of each other, like a distorted snowman. Only this snowman held something in its stick-like hands, a long, jagged spear. My stomach lurched. I'd seen that symbol before. Scrawled in the dirt around my campsite that terrifying night. Whoever, whatever that creature was, it was marking its territory. I backed away slowly not taking my eyes off the tree. The adrenaline surge was giving me tunnel vision. I knew I needed to get out of there, find help, warn someone. But my legs felt like lead. As I stumbled backward, my heel caught on a root. I went down hard, landing on my back with a jarring thump that knocked the air from my lungs. I scrambled to my feet just in time to see a blur of movement from the corner of my eye. It was there, leaping out of the shadows, impossibly fast. I saw the long, sinewy limbs, the hunched, emaciated form covered in patchy gray fur, the claws, the teeth, that horrible, lipless grin stretched across its elongated skull. And those eyes, those glowing yellow pits of hunger boring into me. It lunged, and I instinctively threw up an arm to shield myself. A scream ripped from my throat as a searing pain shot through my forearm. I twisted away, stumbling, 
somehow managing to stay on my feet as another swipe of claws tore through the fabric of my backpack. Run, a voice echoed in my head. But my body wouldn't obey. It was closing in, a guttural growl rumbling in its throat. I fumbled for the pistol again heart pounding so hard I thought it would burst right out of my chest. The creature snarled, leaping towards me for the killing blow. That's when I heard the gunshot. The creature jerked midair, a yelp cut short as a spray of dark blood erupted from its shoulder. It twisted to face this new threat, and for a split second its yellow eyes met mine. In that moment, I saw something flicker within them. Not just animal hunger, but something like confusion. A second gunshot rang out, and then another. I scrambled back, tripping and falling, as more bullets tore into the creature. It shrieked, a terrible, wounded sound, then turned and fled with surprising speed, crashing off into the undergrowth. My rescuer emerged from the trees. An old man, tall and lean, with a thick white beard and a battered cowboy hat perched on his head. He held a rifle loosely in one hand, his gaze steady on the spot where the creature had disappeared. You hurt? he asked, his voice rough but not unkind. I could only nod, still in shock, trying to process what had just happened. Slowly, the trembling started, my teeth chattering so much I could barely speak. The old man lowered his gun. Been tracking that thing, he explained. Taking livestock hereabouts. Seen something like it once before, way back when I was a kid up in Idaho. Skinwalker, my grandpa called it. Shapeshifter. Not a man, not a beast, something in between, and twisted all the way through. He helped me to my feet, guiding me back towards the trail. I managed to blurt out questions, my voice still raspy with fear. Who was he? How did he know I was in trouble? What was that? Skinwalker? The old man chuckled, a dry sound. Name's Silas, he said. Got a cabin a few miles back. Don't much like strangers in these parts, but I see their lights, hear their noise sometimes. You look different. And then I saw those marks, same ones it leaves around its kills. As we walked, Silas regaled me with stories. Of creatures like the one I'd encountered, stories passed down through generations, whispers from the old-timers about the things that stalked the deep wilderness. I listened, numbed yet somehow fascinated. By the time we reached his cabin— Perched on a bluff overlooking a hidden valley, the terror had begun to ebb away. It was replaced with something else, a grim determination. Silas patched me up as best he could, gave me some hot soup, and a stiff drink that burned all the way down. Under his watchful eye, I felt almost safe. I spent the next month there, learning from Silas. Learning how to track how to disappear into the woods, how to anticipate danger both animal and otherwise. There was talk of the skinwalker, of how this one might not be the only one, and the old fear settled back and deep in my bones. But with knowledge came a strange kind of power. I wasn't just some clueless hiker anymore. The day came for me to leave. Silas gave me a worn leather pouch— Salt, he said. Iron. Things like that they hate em. Might not kill one, but it'll keep it at bay. As I set out once more, armed with more than just camping gear this time, I felt different. Scarred changed, but somehow stronger. The nightmares would probably never fully go away, the fear always lurking beneath the surface. But now I knew, deep down, that if I ever met that creature again, I'd be ready. The year was 1996. 
I'd always been one for the solo backcountry experience, ever since my grandpa took me out fishing in the Maine woods when I was a kid. Something about the solitude, the self-reliance, it did something to my soul, you know? That year I decided to tackle a chunk of the Appalachian Trail in Virginia, week-long loop through Shenandoah National Park. Names Ethan, Ethan Rhodes. Weather was glorious the first few days. The fall colors were in full blaze, turning the forest into a fiery tapestry of reds and oranges. The trail wound its way alongside Skyline Drive for a while, offering up panoramic views of the Blue Ridge Mountains. There's a piece to hiking those old trail's rhythmic footsteps, the scent of pine, the dappled sunlight filtering through the leaves. You forget about all your troubles out there. I stopped for lunch on day three at a little clearing beside a creek. Munching on some trail mix, I gazed across the valley below and that's when I saw the cabin. It was way off the beaten track, tucked into this narrow crease between two ridges. Old, weathered wood, part of the roof collapsed in, and not a wisp of smoke coming from the chimney. Didn't look like anyone had been there in years, probably decades. Something about it pricked my curiosity. I've always been a sucker for a good ruin. After a moment's debate with myself, I decided to make a detour. Found a deer trail that angled down the slope, and after a half-hour scramble I found myself in front of that old, forgotten cabin. Place gave me the creeps, to be honest. An abandoned building in the middle of nowhere always sets off some alarm bells in the lizard part of my brain. But being the stubborn fool I am, I didn't turn back. Stepped onto the rotting porch boards, which creaked and groaned under my weight, and eased open the door. It swung inwards on rusty hinges, revealing a single room dim with dust. Musty smell in there, heavy with the scent of decay. Took a few wary steps inside. And that's when I saw the bodies. Two of them, slumped against the far wall. Skeletons, mostly, Clothes rotted away until they were just ragged scraps clinging to the bones. Sun gleamed off the empty white sockets of their skulls. I stumbled backwards, letting out a yell I couldn't quite choke down. My heart was hammering like it wanted to escape my chest. Who were these people? How'd they get here? How long had their bodies been rotting in that forgotten cabin? Then I caught a whiff of something foul. Rot, yes, but different. Like spoiled meat left out in the hot sun. A low growl echoed through the stale air. That's when it stepped out of the shadows. A hulking shape, towering at least seven feet tall. Gaunt, emaciated, with patchy gray skin stretched tight across its bones. Its face, human, mostly, but stretched and distorted into something monstrous. Sharp teeth filled its grinning maw, and its eyes, hollow pits of pure black, fixed on me with a terrible, hungry intent. It snarled, a raspy sound like sandpaper dragged across stone, and lunged. I barely had time to react, throwing myself backwards through the open doorway and scrambling to my feet as splintered wood flew. I ran. Didn't even look back pounded up the slope blindly, branches tearing at my clothing and snagging at my skin. I heard it crashing through the woods behind me, foul snarls mixing with the snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves, gaining on me. I thought of the bodies in the cabin. That's how I'd end up if I didn't get away. A surge of adrenaline gave me a second wind, propelling me onwards. Up ahead a massive oak tree reared up, Roots like gnarled claws bursting from the earth. I veered towards it, a desperate plan forming in my head. Reached the oak just as the creature burst out of the undergrowth behind me. I leapt, catching a stout branch, and hauled myself up with all the strength I could muster. The creature screeched in frustration, leaping from my dangling legs but just missing my boots. 
It paced back and forth below the tree, staring up at me with those hate-filled black eyes. I clung desperately to the branch, muscles burning, every breath rasping in my throat. The sun dipped low, casting long shadows, but the creature showed no signs of leaving. It just waited, pacing, watching. I knew, way up in that tree, that as soon as it got dark, that thing would be coming for me. I could picture those long, clawed fingers wrapping around my ankles, dragging me down. The branch beneath me started to creak ominously. There wasn't time for despair. I had to think, had to find a way out of this, no matter how desperate. Closing my eyes, I tried to force my racing mind to focus. Think, Ethan, think. What would Grandpa have done? Grandpa was tough as nails, a true woodsman. He taught me everything I knew about surviving in the wilderness. And suddenly, I remembered one of his old sayings. If you're backed into a corner, boy, turn a weakness into a weapon. But what weakness? The creature was big, strong, fast. I was pinned up a tree like a cornered squirrel. Then it hit me. Fire. Animals are afraid of fire. I fumbled through my pack with trembling hands, found my lighter and the tin of waterproof matches. Frantically, I snapped off dead twigs from the branches above me, piling them at the base of the trunk. The creature, sensing a shift, shrieked and leapt again, but thankfully stayed on the ground, wary of its prey making an escape. My hands shook so hard the lighter barely flickered. Then, a tiny spark. And another. I nurtured the fragile flame, shielding it from the breeze until it caught onto a leaf, then a twig. Soon I had a small fire blazing beneath me. The creature howled in rage but retreated a few paces back from the flames. It circled the tree now, eyes narrowed, but the flickering light held it at bay. I threw more fuel on the fire, keeping it bright and alive. The hours dragged on. The creature made a few more attempts at my dangling feet, then seemed to settle into a waiting game. Fear not at my insides, but so did a stubborn sort of hope. I had fire, and the beast, for all its strength, wouldn't risk it. Time was on my side. Eventually, the first pale streaks of dawn began to lighten the sky. The creature snarled one last time, then disappeared into the woods. I waited a while longer, until full daylight washed over the trees and I was sure it was gone. Then, stiff and sore, I climbed down. My legs nearly gave out beneath me as I touched the ground. The hike back to the main trail was a blur. Every rustle in the bushes sent my heart racing. But I made it. Flagged down a passing car and told them my story at least, the parts that sounded halfway believable. Left out the creature, of course. Just said I found a couple of bodies, got lost overnight. The park rangers went back to the cabin with me. Found the remains just as I had left them, but, naturally, no sign of the creature that had stalked me through the night. They looked at me like I was either a liar or crazy, but they eventually confirmed the two deceased were a missing couple. Long-term disappearances finally solved. It made the news, but just a small blurb at the bottom of the page. As for me, I never went back to Shenandoah. Sometimes I still see the creature's face in my nightmares, that twisted grin and those hungry black pits for eyes. It took me years to put the experience into words, even in my journal. No one would ever believe it, not truly. I still hike, though. Never alone, and never for more than a day. I carry more than the usual gear, too, a heavier canister of bear spray, a good sharp hunting knife, the kind Grandpa would have approved of. And I always, always have matches. The woods are full of mysteries. Old legends talk about Wendigo, skinwalkers, all sorts of creatures lurking in the shadows. 
The rational part of me says they're just stories, campfire tales meant to spook kids. But another part, a part that was forever changed on that mountainside, listens for the snapping of twigs and the scrape of claws on bark. It knows, deep down, that they're out there. And some secrets are better left undisturbed. It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the green mountains of Vermont. You know how people say they go into the woods for some peace and solitude? Well, I guess I'm not one of those people. I like the mountains, sure, but really I just need an excuse to be away from the city, the traffic, the noise. Being a park ranger, you'd think I'd get enough of the outdoors, but it's different when you're out there for work. My name's Hank, Hank Miller. Been with the Park Service for almost 15 years. Anyway, like I said, I planned that Vermont trip for some time off. Took an extended weekend, nice quiet cabin out in the middle of nowhere. Just what I needed. I'm an avid hiker, you see. The Green Mountain National Forest has some really fantastic trails. First day... It was an easy loop trail, nothing too challenging. Beautiful, though. Saw a family of foxes right beside the path, pups and everything. You don't get moments like that back in New York. Next day, I decided on something more difficult. The long trail, it's called. Now, that one's no joke. Steep climbs, rocky sections. The real deal. I love that stuff, the challenge. Sets your blood pumping. Started early. Only saw two other hikers near the trailhead, an older couple who couldn't have been going more than a mile in. After that, just me and the mountain. Now I'm cautious. I hike alone a lot, but I always do the smart thing. Park rangers get access to maps the public doesn't and I plop my route down to the square foot. Plus, every park has a ranger station. I make sure to leave a copy of my route plan with them before heading out. Not everyone does that, and that's how people get lost. It was around midday, I reckon, when things started getting strange. Not bad strange, at first. Like the feeling when you think someone might be watching you, but you turn around and there's nothing there. You ever had that? Well, that was happening a lot. Made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Then it got weirder. Rocks shifting under my feet on sections of trail where there was no way they should have moved. A branch snapping right beside me, but no wind to speak of. You start to think you're going nuts. That's how it goes. I took a breather, grabbed a drink from my pack, calmed my head, tried to tell myself it was my mind playing tricks. Happens out in the wilderness. Should have trusted my gut. I'd rounded a bend, and there it was. Now I've seen a lot of animals in my time on the job. Bears, moose, plenty of big cats even. This thing, it wasn't like any of them. Standing on two legs, easily as tall as me, maybe taller. Shaggy fur, but patchy, like it had some skin disease. Long claws and big yellow eyes that made me freeze in my tracks. We were maybe twenty feet apart. It cocked its head, and I swear, a flicker of something like curiosity crossed its face. Then it let out this bone-chilling growl, took a step toward me and I did what anyone in my situation would do. I turned and ran. Every survival instinct in me screamed. Didn't matter that it was uphill, that the trail was narrow and covered in loose rocks. I pushed my body like never before. I could hear the thing crashing through the brush behind me, the snorts and heavy breaths echoing off the trees. Didn't even dare look back. My lungs were on fire, the blood roaring in my ears. 
I tripped, caught myself with bloodied hands, and scrambled back to my feet. The thing was closer now. I could smell its rank musk. A few more strides and I'd be at a sheer drop-off. Then what? Maybe it wouldn't follow, but with my luck. Suddenly, gunshots rang out. Not like a hunting rifle. These were bigger, heavier. I saw the creature jerk. A snarl cut short as it stumbled back into the trees. A voice echoed out. Miller? That you? Relief flooded through me, but I shouted back. Who the hell wants to know? It's Parker. Jim Parker. Down from the fire tower. I recognized that name. Another park ranger, tough as nails from what I'd heard. Saw the whole thing. You good to move? I was already scrambling down the ridge toward him. Something was following me. Big thing. Never seen nothing like it. I gasped out, reaching the bottom where he waited, rifle held ready. Yeah, Parker said, looking grim. I bet you haven't. Let's get you back to the station. Lot to figure out. We did a quick check of the area and found no sign of the creature. No blood, no body, nothing. Parker said that wasn't unusual. Whatever these things are that people occasionally report in the backwoods, they tend to be elusive. Smart. Dangerous. I reported the whole incident to the higher-ups, of course. They tried to make it seem like I'd imagined it. Stress, being alone in the woods, whatever. I've dealt with enough idiots to know when they're trying to brush me off. I spent another night up there. Just couldn't bear the thought of going back to the city immediately. Did more hiking, stuck to well-traveled trails, and tried to shake the feeling that I was being watched. Parker and I talked a lot. He believed me, said he'd seen hints of things like what I described out on the patrol, but never that close. We made a plan, more for our own peace of mind than anything else. Tried to track it down. Figure out what it is. The rest of the weekend passed in a blur. Going through the motions, that's the best way to describe it. I got back to New York, took the rest of the week off, but couldn't stop thinking about the Green Mountains. I called up Parker early the following week. We met at a little roadside diner halfway between Vermont and New York. He had a lead. A couple camped out on private land just south of where I was hiking, spotted something similar. Took pictures, though they were blurry. Definitely looked like the same kind of creature I saw. What now? I asked. Parker shrugged. Truth is, Hank, we don't have a lot to go on. We report this officially. At best they send guys in camo, and at worst we both get labeled nut jobs and lose our jobs. So we track it ourselves? I could barely believe I was saying it. His eyes flickered over my face. Maybe. It's a long shot. This thing, these things ain't dumb. Not gonna be easy to find. It was crazy, and more than a little reckless, but the urge to figure this out, it burned inside me. I knew the risks. But I had to try. Next thing he knew, we were both standing in front of the park superintendent, requesting a week off for personal reasons. Parker's a good talker, so we got the leave. Just didn't mention what we'd be doing. Heading back up to Vermont, I won't lie, the excitement was mixed with dread. I checked in at the ranger station where I'd left my original hiking plan. They were no help. No other unusual sightings reported. Parker and I spent days combing the area, going off my encounter, the camper's location, trying to pick up a trail. Nothing turned up. It was like whatever that creature was had vanished into thin air. We followed old deer trails, scanned rocky outcrops, even circled back to the spot where I'd first seen it. Still nothing. 
Frustration started gnawing at my gut. We were running out of time, but something inside me wouldn't let go. We gotta check up near the fire tower, I said to Parker one afternoon. We were both exhausted, dirty, and about ready to give up. You said you saw me from up there, right? Maybe it likes the high ground. Parker rubbed a hand over his stubbled jaw. Could be. Worth a shot, I guess. The hiking was tough, straight up the side of the mountain. But when we finally reached the clearing where the tower stood, a flicker of hope returned. The first sign was a dead rabbit carcass. It wasn't natural decay. Something had ripped into it with vicious claws. Then came the smell. That same musky, animal odor from my first encounter, only stronger this time. We moved slowly, weapons raised. It was twilight, and shadows danced between the trees. I could feel every muscle in my body tense as we approached the base of the tower. Then I saw it. The creature was huge, crouched on the lowest rung of the ladder, just barely visible against the fading light. It was feeding on something. I didn't want to know what. Parker whispered. Stay low. We'll circle around, get a clean shot from the cover of the trees. My heart pounded like a drum. We crept forward, careful not to make a sound. I knew this was it, our best, and maybe only chance. As we closed the distance, I got a clearer look at the thing. Its fur was matted in patches, revealing scabby, leathery skin. The head was, it looked almost canine, but warped and twisted, with a jaw that jutted out unnaturally. Parker raised his rifle, aiming for a clear shot at the creature's exposed flank. My finger tensed on the trigger of my own gun. One move, one wrong step, and it would be on us in a flash. Then it happened. The creature lifted its head, yellow eyes locking onto our position. It let out a blood-curdling roar, a sound that seemed to shake the very trees, and in one fluid motion was leaping off the tower toward us. Parker fired, the shot echoing through the twilight. I fired just a second later. We both hit our mark, bullets finding the creature's shoulder and chest. It stumbled, roared again in pain, then turned and charged deeper into the trees. I had no time to think, just to react. After it! Parker yelled, and we were off, scrambling over rocks and fallen branches in a desperate chase. The fading light made it almost impossible to track, but we followed the sounds of crashing branches and the occasional guttural cry. It was wounded, but clearly still powerful. Fear and adrenaline were an intoxicating mix, propelling me forward even as my lungs burned. Suddenly, the trees opened into a clearing. The creature lay in the middle, blood staining the leaves around it. It still moved, but weakly its breath ragged gasps. We cautiously approached, weapons at the ready. That's when I saw its face up close. The yellow eyes, now dimming, still held a spark of feral hatred. The twisted muzzle, the teeth dripping with blood that wasn't its own. What the hell is that? I croaked out, disbelief warring with terror in my voice. Parker didn't answer. I don't think he could. We just stood there, staring at the thing as it took its last, shuddering breath. In the light of dawn... We examined the carcass. It had massive paws with hooked claws, a tail long and whip-like, and that misshapen head, it looked like a dog, but a dog from some twisted nightmare. Finally, Parker spoke. Best guess, Hank, we stumbled onto some kind of cryptid. Something the locals whisper about, but no one officially believes in. One of those stories passed down through families. Looks like it wasn't just a story, I said grimly. I thought back to that moment of first contact, its curiosity, not outright aggression. 
Was it just as surprised to see me as I was it? We'd never know. We didn't report what we'd found. No point. Who would believe us? Instead, we did our best to bury the carcass, swore each other to secrecy, and went back to our lives as park rangers. It was easier that way. The aftermath was a strange thing. Part of me is glad those things, whatever they are, remain a hidden part of the wilderness. Some things are better left unknown, tucked away in the shadows of the deep woods. But another part of me, well, I wonder, how many more are out there? What if my encounter hadn't ended the way it did? Would we have stumbled into a whole pack of those creatures? Sometimes, when I hear a rustling in the bushes or a branch snap in the distance, I think of those yellow eyes, that rank smell, and a shiver runs down my spine. The mountains don't feel quite the same anymore, but then again neither do I. The year was 1976, and I'd planned this trip to the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee for months. My name's Doug, Doug Ellison, and while maybe I ain't what you'd call an experienced outdoorsman, I've got enough sense to respect the wilderness. That's why I always pick established trails, the ones most traveled. You know, the kind with those reassuring painted blazes on the trees to guide you. I'm an accountant by trade, so come the weekends, getting a little lost in the woods is about as good as relaxation gets. Throw in some fresh air and exercise, and I'm basically in paradise. Well, paradise with bugs and humidity, I suppose. This particular hike was meant to be a loop trail, moderate difficulty according to the guidebook. I started off early. Packed my trusty day pack full of snacks, water, a basic first aid kit, all the essentials. For the first few miles, everything was as it should be. Bird song filled the air, sunlight dappled through the leaves, and the trail was well maintained, even welcoming. Then again, maybe I'd just spoken too soon. Around midday, I reckon, things started to feel off. It wasn't any major change, just a gnawing sense that something wasn't quite right. The bird song faded away, replaced with a hush like the woods were holding their breath. The trail, once so clear, became overgrown, like that guidebook lied about how often hikers took this route. I paused, took a long swig of water, and tried to shake the feeling that I was being watched. Come on, Doug, I told myself, you're just psyching yourself out. Nothing to worry about out here in the middle of the day. Still, I couldn't shake the unease. I decided the best thing was to press on. Get further in, then figure out if I just misread the map or something. Another mile passed, the sense of something, off, getting stronger with each step. Then I saw it. A deer carcass picked almost to the bone. Not a normal sight on a popular trail. My heart started pounding faster, but then I told myself to relax. Could have been a cougar or something, right? Predators gotta eat, even out here. That's when I noticed the gnaw marks on the bones. Didn't look like any cat work I'd ever seen. They were jagged uneven, like they were torn, not cleanly bitten and the way the carcass was sprawled, not natural positioning, not for a deer brought down in a hunt. A flicker of movement above made me snap my head up. Buzzards were circling. Of course they were. That's when it hit me, the smell. Not the usual forest smells. This was like rotting flesh with something metallic mixed in. I gagged, fighting the urge to throw up. That wasn't normal, not for an animal death. Whatever killed that deer. I turned to leave, to just get out of this suddenly nightmarish section of trail. Before I could take a step, I froze. 
There, maybe twenty feet ahead, blocking the path, stood the creature. I tell you, it looked like nothing from this earth. Standing on two legs, tall as me, maybe taller. Lean, covered in coarse gray fur, it had a hunched posture and a snout that was way too long and filled with pointed teeth. Its eyes, Lord, those eyes, pure black, with a gleam like polished stones. The thing took a step toward me, letting out this low growl that vibrated right through my bones. This wasn't a predator sizing up its prey, though. This felt different. Wrong. I did what I guess any normal man would do in that situation. I screamed and bolted back down the trail. Forget the path. I crashed through the undergrowth, branches whipping my face, thorns tearing at my skin. Didn't matter. All that mattered was getting away. I heard the thing behind me, snarls mixing with the snapping of twigs under its heavy feet. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck, could almost taste the stink of it as I pushed my body past its limits. And still, it gained on me. Suddenly, a drop off. I skidded to a halt at the edge, peering down at a rocky creek bed maybe thirty feet below. No choice now. I took a deep, desperate breath and leaped. Hitting the ground sent a jolt of pain through my leg, but I didn't stop. I scrambled on, somehow ignoring the agony, splashing through the shallow creek and stumbling further from that clearing. I don't know how long I ran. I just kept going until my vision blurred and my lungs burned like fire. Finally, I collapsed against a tree, gasping for breath. When I could think straight, I realized two things. It was getting dark, and I had no idea where I was. That trail guidebook, my trusty map, all useless back wherever I'd fled from. I was well and truly lost. My leg throbbed, and my stomach churned with both terror and exhaustion. I cursed myself for being a stubborn fool, for not turning back when I first felt uneasy. Still, no use dwelling on it. Had to survive the night, then try to find my way out come morning. I managed to find a dry overhang to shelter under, ate a small ration of trail mix, and tried to calm my racing mind enough to sleep. Fitful as it was, the exhaustion eventually won out. First light, I set off, following the creek downstream. It had to lead somewhere, right? Every mile was agony, but I kept going, fueled by the terror of what lurked back in the woods if I turned around. It took two days. Two days of stumbling, rationing water, and trying to ignore the gnawing fear in my gut. When I finally stumbled across a dirt road, practically delirious, it felt like a miracle. An hour or more, and a kind old farmer in a beat-up truck gave me a ride to the nearest ranger station. Now, I told them about the carcass, about my sense of being hunted. But the creature? I kept that to myself. They'd think I was crazy, probably lock me up for my own good. The year was 1995. I always wanted to explore the desert that kind of raw, desolate beauty has a powerful draw. Figured there was no time like the present, so I packed up my jeep and headed down to Big Bend National Park in Texas. I'm no survival expert, but I'm prepared. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt James, and planning is kind of my thing. I spent my life as an accountant, so you could say I'm obsessed with being organized. Now, this trip, I mapped out some moderate hiking trails. Nothing too extreme, especially since I was out there solo. Safety first, right? Well, that was the plan anyway. Second day in, I started on a trail, the Marufo Vega Loop. Sun was already high in the sky by the time I got started 
but nothing a few extra water bottles couldn't handle. The first few miles were a breeze. The trail was well maintained, the scenery stark but stunning. I'll admit, there's something about the desert that rattles the city clean out of you. It puts things into perspective, you know? Mid-afternoon, I figured I was maybe halfway through the loop. Decided to stop for a bite, enjoy the view. See, there were these old ruins off a little side path barely visible from the main trail. Former ranch, according to the guidebook. Seemed like a decent spot for lunch. Getting closer to those ruins is when things started feeling odd. Not scary at first, just unnatural. It was the quiet. You expect a little wind, maybe the rustle of lizards, but this? Dead silence. Not even birdsong. I started picking up my pace, feeling a prickle of unease on the back of my neck. The ruins themselves were pretty much just crumbling stone walls and foundations. Nothing fancy. I sat down in the shade of what used to be a doorway, cracked open a protein bar, and tried to shake the weird feeling. That's when I saw the bones. A pile of them. Not animal bones, I realized with a jolt. Human. A chill ran down my spine. My first thought was maybe an old burial site, Native American or something. But then I noticed the way the bones were scattered, nod. Something about those jagged edges didn't look natural. I was getting a bad feeling about this whole place. Time to skedaddle. I stood up, brushing dirt off my pants, and then I saw him. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Heat, dehydration, all that. He stood on a rise maybe a hundred feet away, his outline shimmering against the bright sky. Tall and broad, but with all the wrong proportions, arms too long, head too big for his body. He was bald, skin grayish in the harsh sunlight. When he turned towards me, I saw his eyes, flat black, with a gleam like polished stone. Now I'm not the fainting type, but let me tell you, primal terror kicked in. I froze, my heart pounding like a rabbit's. The creature, whatever it was, took a slow step forward. His mouth opened, revealing a row of two sharp teeth. Then he let out a roar. Wasn't like any animal I'd ever heard. More like something scraping across rusty metal, a sound that set my teeth on edge and kicked me out of my frozen stupor. I didn't bother with my things. I just ran. Ran like a madman, back towards the trail, half tripping over rocks and spiny plants. I risked a glance back. That thing was on my tail, bounding along as if gravity barely affected it. Every crashing step, Every guttural snarl, it was pushing me closer to the edge of panic. The trail seemed miles away, the desert stretching out forever. My lungs burned, my legs screamed in protest, but I didn't dare stop. My only hope was to make it to the main trail. More people, a ranger station, something. Just then, I hit a patch of loose gravel and went sprawling face first. Pain ripped through my knee, my palms scraped raw on the rocks, but I scrambled upright. Couldn't stop now. I saw the creature closing in, a grotesque silhouette against the blazing sun. He lunged. Then a shout. A man's voice. Hey! Over here! Run! I risked another glance back and saw a man on the main trail, waving frantically. He had a rifle in his hands. That burst of hope was just the fuel I needed. I surged forward, fueled by adrenaline and newfound desperation. The creature hesitated, glancing between me and the man with the rifle. Seemed to be weighing its options. For a moment I thought I might actually make it. Then the creature took off in the opposite direction disappearing behind a tumble of boulders. 
I stumbled the last few yards to the trail, collapsing against the man with the rifle. His name was Harlan, a local hunter out chasing coyotes. He was my age, give or take, with weathered skin and a steady gaze. He helped me up, asked if I was hurt. I told him about the ruins, the bones, the creature. He listened intently, nodding sometimes, a frown creasing his face. You saw one of them, he said finally, his voice low. People round here call em skinwalkers. He didn't sound surprised, though. This wasn't his first rodeo. I stammered out something about reporting it, but he just shook his head. Folks who try that wind up looking crazy. They won't believe you. Best bet is just to forget the whole thing. Head back down the mountain. Harlan walked me to my jeep, the rifle slung over his shoulder. I thanked him over and over, not sure what else to do. Part of me wanted to argue, to insist we do something, but the haunted look in Harlan's eyes told me it was a lost cause. The drive out of Big Ben felt like leaving a nightmare. My leg throbbed, my hands burned, and I kept seeing those black eyes in the rearview mirror. Harlan was right. Tell anyone what I saw, and they'd write me off as some sun-addled hiker. But staying silent felt like a betrayal, like those bones wouldn't get any kind of justice. Weeks later, I was still haunted by the experience. At first, tried burying it. Back to my routine, back to the safe predictability of numbers and spreadsheets. It didn't work. Every creak in my apartment sounded like those in human footsteps. Every shadow seemed to hide a monstrous shape. Finally, I snapped. Couldn't live like this anymore. I quit my job, cashed out my savings, and headed back to Texas. Not to Big Bend, somewhere less remote, with better cell service. Seemed insane even to me but the alternative was feeling like I was going insane. I rented a small cabin outside a town called El Paso, close enough to civilization but still on the desert's edge. Use the internet. Public libraries are a godsend to dig into local lore, old newspaper archives, anything that might shed light on what I saw. Turns out Harlan's skinwalker wasn't far off. There were Native American legends, whispers among old-timers out on remote ranches' stories that mirrored my experience too closely to be coincidence. Some described them as shapeshifters, others as a kind of vengeful spirit. Didn't make him any less real, though. Weeks turned into months. I spent my days tracking down every scrap of information I could find. Nights were worse. I didn't sleep much, and when I did, the nightmares were brutal. The creature stalking me, the bones crunching under its feet, that bone-chilling roar. In those dark hours, a voice started whispering in my head. Maybe fighting this thing was my purpose. If folks wouldn't listen, fine. I'd deal with it myself. It was reckless, probably flat-out crazy. But when you've stared into those flat black eyes, the world doesn't seem so normal anymore. I picked up a used hunting rifle, practiced at a range until I could hit a dinner plate at a hundred yards. Learned about tracking, how to set traps. Filled my cabin with survival gear, everything to give me a fighting chance if it came down to it. I guess some part of me was waiting for the creature to find me. Figured if it knew I was out there, maybe it would come for a rematch. Every rustle of wind had me jumpy, rifle at the ready. I spent nights on my porch, scanning the desert with night vision goggles. Nothing. Months stretched by, and I started to doubt myself. Had I really seen what I thought I saw? Was I just losing my grip completely? I even convinced myself to go on a few dates with a woman from town, trying to tether myself back to a regular life. Then, one sweltering summer evening, it started. 
the dogs in town barking like mad, a chorus of howls that set my teeth on edge. I knew that unnatural sound. Drove into El Paso, found the streets mostly deserted except for a few stray dogs, tails tucked low, whimpering. A knot formed in my stomach. This was it. I walked through the empty streets, clutching my rifle, heart pounding in my chest. That silence, the same creepy silence from Big Bend, settled over the town. I found the source of the commotion near the town square. A family, mother, father, and a young boy, huddled against the wall, their faces pale with terror. And there, in the shadows, was the creature. It hadn't changed. Same hunched posture, same glistening black eyes, same aura of pure wrongness. The family whimpered, the boy crying softly, as the creature stalked closer. I couldn't just stand there. Couldn't let it hurt them. I raised my rifle, lining up a shot in the dimness. I'd aimed at plenty of targets, but nothing like this. Somehow, my hands were steady. My fingers squeezed the trigger. The shot echoed in the unnatural silence. The creature stumbled, letting out a deafening roar that was part pain, part pure rage. I fired again, hitting it in the shoulder. It turned and ran, disappearing into the night with astonishing speed. For a moment, the only sound was the family's ragged breathing. Then, people started coming out of hiding, drawn by the gunshots and the creature's retreat. In the chaos that followed, I didn't stick around for explanations. I grabbed the family, bundled them into my truck, and drove until sunrise. Dropped them at a gas station outside of town, gave them some cash, told them to get as far away as possible and never look back. When I got back to my cabin, it was trashed. Belongings scattered, furniture smashed. No sign of the creature itself, but the message was clear. It knew where I lived. The sensible thing would have been to cut and run, start over somewhere new. But I was done running. I spent the next few weeks turning my cabin into a fortress. Solar panels for power, rainwater collection system, enough supplies to last months. Reinforce the doors and windows, set up alarms. Every night, I'd position myself with the rifle, waiting. It felt like a twisted kind of hunting trip. Me as the prey, but this time, I was armed and ready. The creature came back a few weeks later, testing my defenses. A few nights later, it tried again. I managed to land a shot, drew blood, but it still got away. Each attack, I learned a bit more about its tactics its strengths and weaknesses. I learned that it wasn't invincible. Word spread about the strange hermit holding up in the desert. Some folks thought I was nuts, others figured I was dangerous. A local reporter tried sniffing out the story, but I managed to scare her off. It's been years now. The attacks are less frequent, but the thing's still out there. I've become a local legend, some kind of desert boogeyman. People warn their kids about me. Sometimes I still wonder if what I'm doing even matters. Did I save anyone, or did I just become another monster lurking in the shadows? Truth is, I don't have the answers. All I know is, I made a choice, and this is where it led. Every night I watch the desert horizon, rifle in hand and wait for those black eyes to gleam back at me from the darkness. I figure it's the closest thing to an afterlife I'm gonna get. The year was 2002, and I was through hiking the Appalachian Trail. That kind of long-distance trek gets in your blood, you know? Months on the trail, just you, your pack, and the wilderness stretching out ahead. I'm Tyson, Tyson Miller, 
and if I'm bragging, I'd say I was born for this kind of life. Now, the ad is well-marked, well-traveled. You don't find many surprises out there. Still, you learn to respect the woods, the weather, the wildlife. Things can turn on a dime, no matter how prepared you think you are. That respect, that's what kept me alive through what happened that summer in the great smoky mountains of Tennessee. The day started like any other. Up at dawn, a quick breakfast of oatmeal and dried fruit, then back on the trail. I was nearing Klingman's Dome, highest point on the whole trail. I figured I'd stop at the shelter there for a longer meal before pushing on. Been looking forward to the views for weeks. It was early afternoon when I noticed something off. It wasn't like any animal tracks I'd ever seen. Too wide, the wrong shape, like, well, like a naked human foot, but way too big. Shrugged it off at first. Maybe someone lost a shoe, maybe an experienced barefoot hiker with monstrous feet. Wasn't my problem anyway. Kept moving, figuring I could puzzle over it later. Half an hour on, something else. A rustle in the trees off to my left, like something big moving through the undergrowth. This time it didn't feel like just an animal. There was a kind of awareness to the sound, if that makes sense. I stopped, scanned the tree lean, trying to get a look at whatever it was. Heart was starting to thump faster, but I chalked it up to the fact that I was alone out here. Imagination plays tricks. Then, a flicker of movement, a flash of gray shifting between the trunks of two massive old hemlocks. My pulse quickened. Whatever it was, it had been watching me. I yelled out, Hello? Anyone there? Hiker coming through. That kind of thing usually works with bears, mountain lions even. Let's them know you ain't prey. Silence. Not even the chirp of a bird. Now, I was pretty sure my mind wasn't playing tricks. If I'd learned one thing on this trail, it was to trust your gut. Something was definitely out there. Didn't mean it was dangerous, but no way I was gonna find out by standing around. I picked up the pace, trying to shake the feeling that I had eyes on me. Every few steps, I'd toss a look over my shoulder. Nothing but dense forest and the trail snaking back behind me. About a mile later, the feeling finally started to fade. Just a skittish hiker spoken himself, I figured. Maybe I just needed a proper lunch. Just as I thought I was in the clear, that's when I saw the first body. It was just off the trail, half hidden behind a rhododendron bush. It was a man, a middle-aged dude in hiking gear. It took me a second to realize what was wrong. His neck looked broken, twisted at an impossible angle, and his eyes were wide open, frozen in absolute terror. I stumbled back, tripped over a rock, and landed hard on my butt. Nausea rolled over me. What the hell kind of accident could do that to a guy? Then I heard it the same rustling from before, closer this time. A low growl echoed through the trees, and I swear, it sounded almost gleeful. I scrambled to my feet, all thoughts of lunch forgotten. That thing, whatever it was, had killed this man. That meant I was next. Turned and bolted, back down the way I'd come. Ran like I've never run before. Branches whipped at my face, rocks rolled under my boots, but I didn't look back. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the underbrush, its guttural growls making my blood run cold. Then, a new sound, a woman screaming. Up ahead, maybe a quarter mile down the trail. My heart sank. There were more victims. The woman was half collapsed against a tree, sobbing. Didn't notice me at first, then she looked up, her eyes wild. It got him, she gasped. It got Kevin, snapped his neck like a twig. 
I knelt next to her, tried calming her down enough to get her name. It was Sarah. Where? I asked. Where is it? Figured if I could pinpoint the creature, that gave us a fighting chance. Sarah pointed a shaky finger back up the trail. Just around the bend, big clearing with rocks. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. The clearing, that's where I'd seen those huge footprints. We had to move, make some distance. No way we could fight that thing, not on our own. Sarah wasn't in great shape to run, so I helped her up, gave her a trekking pole for support, and we started hobbling down the trail as fast as we could manage. Behind us, the growling grew fainter, but I knew it hadn't given up. That clearing felt like it was miles away. When we got there, my worst fears were confirmed. Two more hikers, torn to ribbons. More of those giant footprints pressed into the soft earth. What kind of monster does this? Sarah whispered, her voice barely audible over the pounding of our hearts. Now, I'd seen the ugly side of nature before. Animal attacks can be brutal. But this, this was something else. Calculated. Savage. I had no answers for her, no comfort to offer. All I could do was keep moving. We stumbled on, following the trail south, hoping to reach a shelter or a ranger station. Terror fueled our steps but exhaustion was starting to set in. As the sun began to dip below the tree lean, I spotted a flicker of light through the trees. A road! We might actually make it out. Mustering the last of our strength, we staggered out of the woods and onto the pavement. We half crawled, half collapsed against the guardrail, panting and gasping for breath. Seeing that road felt like a miracle, but we still weren't out of the woods, and the light was fading fast. Just then, headlights rounded the bend. My heart leapt with hope. I waved frantically, shouting for help. The car, a beat-up old pickup truck, screeched to a halt, and a man with a bushy beard and a weathered face hopped out. What in the hell happened to you folks? he asked, his voice laced with a thick southern drawl. Words tumbled out of me, the creature, the bodies, how we barely escaped. Sarah choked out her story, too, her voice ragged with terror and grief. The man listened, a grim expression on his face. But when I finished, he didn't call me crazy, no looks of disbelief. He just nodded slowly. Been hearing stories about something like that, he said. Folks round here don't talk much about it, but the woods are old, hold all kinds of things best left undisturbed. I stared at him, a flicker of hope rekindling. Had he seen this creature too? Could he help? Please, I said, we need to get back to town. It's still out there. He looked at us, at the fading daylight, and made a decision. Get in, he said and bring those trekking poles. Might need em. We piled into his truck, the musty scent of old leather and tobacco almost comforting after the terror we'd just escaped. The truck roared to life, and we bumped down the road towards civilization. On the drive, the man told us his name was Jeb. He'd been a hunting guide in these mountains his whole life, knew these woods like the back of his hand. He'd heard whispers from other hikers' sightings of something strange, and even rumors passed down in old mountain families of beings long forgotten. Could be a Wendigo, he murmured, the word strange on his tongue. Powerful spirit driven mad by hunger, takes many forms, could look like a man sometimes. When I pressed him, his descriptions sounded eerily familiar, the giant stature, the inhuman strength those chilling, growling sounds. The puzzle pieces were starting to click into place, but it felt more like a nightmare than any kind of reality I understood. We reached the ranger station just as darkness fell. 
burst inside, babbling our story to a stunned ranger. Within an hour, the place was on lockdown. A search party was assembled. Rangers, volunteers, even Jeb with his ancient-looking rifle. They headed into the forest, flashlights cutting into the night. We could only wait. Dawn broke, but there was no news, no word of the creature's capture. My stomach churned. Was it still out there, or worse, had it found new victims? Days stretched into weeks. The official report came back inconclusive. No trace of the creature was ever found. Sarah and I testified, but our descriptions were dismissed as trauma-induced hallucinations or misidentifications of a bear attack. No charges could be filed, no killer brought to justice. The victims became another whispered tale among through hikers, a cautionary story around campfires. I was labeled the survivor, the lucky one who escaped whatever lurked in those woods. But I refused to let it go. Couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, maybe even watching. The trail called to me, but it was mixed with dread now. Finally, I made a decision. I wasn't a hunter, but I could learn. I moved into a cabin near the base of the Smokies. Spent my days in the library, scouring old books for any mention of creatures like Jeb had described. Nights, I'd go out into the woods, armed with tracking skills gleaned from survival manuals, searching for any sign at all. People in town started thinking I'd finally cracked. The crazy hiker who talked to trees and chased his own shadow. And maybe they were right. Years passed. Seasons blurred together. My life became one long, tense patrol. There were times I nearly convinced myself it was all my imagination. Then I'd stumble upon more of those giant footprints, or find the remains of a deer ripped apart like it was a chew toy, and I knew I wasn't crazy. Then, one cold winter night I saw it. Not up close, thank God. Just a glimpse high on a ridge, silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was enormous, hunched over, moving with unsettling speed. The shock turned to cold determination. I wasn't a victim anymore. I was the hunter now. I started making preparations. Bought a better rifle, night vision goggles. Spent hours at the firing range until I could hit a quarter from two hundred yards. Studied everything I could about the Wendigo, its supposed strengths and weaknesses. I wasn't sure if any of it was real, but it felt better than doing nothing. The locals don't talk to me much anymore. Think I'm a lost cause, and they're probably not wrong. I catch whispers behind my back, the same old rumors about the crazy mountain man who's hunting ghosts. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if they're right. But then I think of the hikers who never made it back from the trail. The look in Sarah's haunted eyes. And I know, crazy or not, there's unfinished business between me and whatever haunts those woods. One day, it'll make a mistake, and I'll be ready. And if it gets me, well, at least I went out like the old tales say you should when dealing with a Wendigo, swinging an axe and spitting in its eye. It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the Angeles National Forest. I love hiking, been doing it since I was a kid. There's something about the quiet, the trees, the smell of pine. Makes you feel insignificant, yet completely connected to the world. I always go alone. Not an antisocial thing, more of a safety thing. Less chance of making stupid mistakes that get folks hurt when you're on your own. This time I picked a trail I hadn't done before, the Devil's Canyon Trail head up by Pasadena. It looked about the right level of difficulty, a good loop trail, so I could be in and out in daylight. 
packed up the jeep, grabbed my gear, and hit the road. The trailhead's popular but it was a weekday, so not too bad. Most folks were out for a quick afternoon hike, nothing serious. I set off, going deeper into the woods. After an hour or so, the path was pretty narrow, overgrown some, so it felt more secluded. Wasn't worried, though. I know these hills. Funny thing happened, though. Usually, there are all kinds of sounds, birds, squirrels, that rustling of little critters scampering away. On this trail, nothing. It was quiet, like eerily so. Didn't even hear wind hitting the leaves. I stopped for a minute, just listening, and I swear it got even quieter. Decided to joke to myself. Better not meet some crazed hermit. Bet his name's Zeke. Yeah, probably reads too many westerns, that kind of thing. Should have kept my mouth shut. About twenty minutes after that, the stench hit me. It wasn't like roadkill or anything normal. Smelled metallic and kind of sweet, all wrong. There was an overhang up ahead where the trail kind of dipped, so I thought maybe it was coming from there. I slowed down, got my walking stick ready, not for walking anymore, obviously. If it was a mountain lion, I might have a chance to scare it off. If it was a bear, well, I'd probably taste like berries. I peeked around the corner, and the smell almost knocked me out. Wasn't an animal, not one I've ever known. There was a clearing, and in the middle, well, let's just say some poor soul got torn up real bad. I mean, not recognizable as a whole piece anymore. Should have turned around right then. Called the rangers, got the heck out of there, all the smart things my dad taught me. But I don't scare easily, and I've got a morbid fascination that I really need to get under control. So like a dummy, I kept going. The trail opened up a bit past the clearing, wound its way uphill around some huge boulders. Then I saw it, hunched behind a tree, about a hundred feet away. At first, I couldn't make it out. The thing was massive, but its coloring blended into the shadows. Then it moved. I still wish I hadn't seen it properly. Lord, I wish I'd run. It was tall, seven, maybe eight feet, and lean. Not lean like skinny, lean like all muscle. Its skin, Christ, it looked like old leather, stretched too tight, and mottled gray and green. The head, though. It had this enormous head, bald and kind of lumpy with these oversized black eyes set way too far apart. No ears that I could see, but a mouth full of jagged teeth. This thing, I still can't bring myself to call it a man. It stared at me, and those eyes, there was intelligence there, like it was calculating. I should have bolted, but I was frozen. Suddenly it lunged. Not at me, but to the side. It disappeared behind a rock and a second later, I heard a shriek. A high-pitched, terrified, human shriek. I snapped out of it, and without thinking, I was running in the direction of the scream. It sounded like a kid, maybe a teenage girl. Adrenaline can make you stupid. I wasn't armed, barely had my walking stick. And what was I gonna do, poke this creature in the eye? I rounded a bend, and there it was. Had the girl pinned to the ground, its teeth bared, but hadn't bitten yet, not that I could see. It was just looking at her, those eyes cold, expressionless. Without thinking, I yelled. Just let out a primal roar and charged, swinging my stick like a baseball bat. The creature looked startled, whipped its head around to me. The girl scrambled away, sobbing. The creature didn't hesitate. It leapt for me, speed I wouldn't have thought possible. I swung, felt the stick connect with something solid, but it barely slowed down. It landed on me, knocking me flat, and I saw those teeth coming from my throat. 
Then a gunshot, loud, echoing in the canyon, and another. The creature shrieked, not in pain though, more like rage. It scrambled off me, but not away. It circled, eyes fixed on me, and I could see blood dripping from its side. Then I heard a man's voice. Stay down! Don't move! The creature hissed, spittle flying. Didn't want to take its eyes off me, but the voice must have been spooking it. Finally, it turned and vanished into the trees, moving with that inhuman speed again. A few minutes later, two forest rangers came down the trail, rifles out. One took the girl, hysterical but unheard it seemed, back down. The other, an older guy with a serious look, approached me cautiously. You all right? He helped me up, looked at the blood on my shirt. That's not yours. Couldn't speak. Just shook my head. Name's Ranger Dalton. What the hell happened here? I told him. Everything, even the dumb stuff, the joking about hermits. He listened, never said a word, just a nod when I described the creature. You did good, son, he said finally. Real good. Saved that girl's life. Now let's get you out of here. They checked me over, got my statement at the station. When I mentioned the body in the clearing, Dalton just frowned. Said they'd search but never found any trace. That whole day has a hazy, dreamlike feel now. The drive home, even getting dinner, was all on autopilot. Here's the thing. I know what I saw. The stench, the creature itself, even the ranger's reaction. It wasn't disbelief, it was something else. Like he'd seen it too, or heard about it. I keep thinking of the girl, hoping she's okay. And hoping she never has to see that thing again. Me? I'm not going back to those woods. Some trails are better left untrodden. But that creature, it's out there. And if I, some random hiker, ran into it, someone else will too. The summer of 79, I figured I'd do the whole Appalachian Trail. You know, start in Georgia, walk till you hit Maine, that kind of thing. Never did it, honestly. Got sidetracked, life happens. But that year, to test myself, I hit a good chunk of Virginia, Shenandoah National Park. My name's Trevor, by the way. People call me Trev. I've always loved the woods. Something grounding about them, the silence and the smell of earth. Even as a kid, I'd disappear into the trees behind our house, build forts, imagine all sorts of stuff. That's the thing, isn't it? Imagination has a lot to answer for. Anyway, Shenandoah in summer, it can get crowded. The Park Service website warns you about overcrowding, trail closures, even bears. But I figured, hey, that's the main paths, the tourist ones. The lesser-known trails, that's where you find the good stuff. Found a route online near Big Meadows. Packed my gear. Figured I was set for a few days at least. It was already hot when I parked at the trailhead. Not many cars, so that was a relief. Shouldered my pack and started on the path that would loop me out through the park. First hour or so was fine. Birdsong, dappled light, the usual. Then things got a little off. This wasn't the gradual thinning of hikers you'd get on longer trails. It was like everyone else vanished all at once. Not a person, not even a footprint in the dirt aside from my own. I'm not a superstitious guy, but you know that feeling you get in the back of your neck? Yeah, that one. Shrugged it off, told myself I was being paranoid. Happens when you're alone in the woods this long. You start to play tricks on yourself. Funny thing is, 
the wildlife disappeared too. No squirrels, no deer, not even insects buzzing around. Made me slow down, pay closer attention. Wasn't worried, just curious. Then I saw the footprints. Not human, definitely not. They were huge, each one twice the size of my boot, and with way too many toes. Five, I think. Whatever made those tracks was big and strong, and moving in my direction. Found myself wishing I'd brought my shotgun. Dad always said to be prepared when you're out on a trail, but I figured a walking stick would be enough. Idiot. Trail led me into a narrow ravine, trees tall on either side, blocking out most of the light. I could smell water, but couldn't see it. That's when something grunted from up ahead. My heart started pounding, mouth went dry. I wasn't curious anymore, just plain scared. I crept forward, stick ready. The smell got stronger, not like anything I knew. Imagine roadkill left out for a week in the sun, mixed with the wet musk of a zoo animal, and add a hint of something sharp and metallic. Made my stomach turn. Rounded a bend and saw a clearing a few yards ahead. Whatever had grunted was there, and it was. I don't even know how to describe it. Huge, standing maybe nine feet tall, shoulders broader than any man's. The skin was this weird, mottled green, kind of slick-looking, with thick ridges and places. And the head, that's what got me. It was bulbous, too big for the body with these bulging eyes that took up half its face. No hair, not anywhere, and a lipless mouth that hung open, dripping with drool. The thing was hunched over something in the grass. I didn't want to see what, but then it lifted its head, and I caught a glimpse of red. I knew, without having to see properly, that it was eating. A twig snapped under my boot, loud as a gunshot in the silence. The creature froze, its giant black eyes fixing on me. Then it let out a roar, a sound that shook the trees and sent a flock of birds scattering. I panicked. Turned and ran, didn't care where, just away from that thing. It lumbered after me, its strides long and deceptively fast. I could hear it crashing through the undergrowth, the smell of it hot on my heels. Tripped over a root, slammed into the dirt. My pack tumbled off, scattering water bottles and energy bars. Rolled over, scrabbling for my stick, and there it was. Ten feet away, looming over me, its breath coming in ragged gasps. It tilted its head, like it was confused. Maybe a walking stick wasn't much of a threat, even to something driven wild by hunger. Then we both heard it, a man's voice shouting. Not close, but getting closer. The creature seemed to hesitate, looking between me and the direction of the sound. For a crazy moment, I thought it might run that the guy, whoever it was, might scare it off. Then its eyes narrowed, and it lunged. Didn't even go for my throat, just grabbed my arm in its massive, clawed hand and took off back into the trees. Pain exploded in my shoulder, a sickening crunching sound, and then just the feeling of being dragged through the undergrowth, screaming with every bump and scrape. I tried to fight, to grab for tree trunks or roots, but it was too strong. The smell of it, the hot breath on my face, was making me gag. I don't know how long it dragged me, seemed like forever. At one point, the trees thinned, and I caught a glimpse of a road, maybe a fire lane. Some part of my brain thought about yelling for help, but what was I gonna say? Hey, that freak in the woods is carrying me off. Someone mind lending a hand? We were slowing, the creature breathing harder. Whatever it had grabbed to eat must not have lasted long. Suddenly, it stopped and hurled me aside like a ragdoll. I slammed against a boulder, a wave of black washing over my vision. 
I heard shouting, much closer now, than a gunshot echoing off the hills. The creature roared again, but this time there was a different note to it, almost like pain. I struggled to my knees, the world swimming around me. More shots rang out, and the thing howled, crashing back through the trees the way it had come. For a moment, there was just the echo of the gun and the thudding of my own heart. Then a man came tearing into the clearing. He wore a park ranger uniform, rifle in hand, and his face was pale. Jesus, he breathed, lowering the gun and rushing to me. You all right? I couldn't speak, just gasped, trying to catch my breath. My shoulder was on fire, and when I glanced down, my arm was twisted at an impossible angle, bone poking through the skin. I think that's when I passed out. Woke up in the hospital, ranger hovering nearby. The rest is a bit of a blur, concussion, shattered bones, weeks of surgery, the works. They never found the creature, or any sign of it. Said it was probably a bear attack, though they couldn't explain, well, any of it, really. Sometimes, lying there in that sterile hospital bed, I'd swear I could smell it again. That hot, rotten stink, the wet fur, the blood. I still dream about those eyes, bulging in black, staring at me with something I can't put a name to. Wasn't animal hunger, wasn't mindless rage. There was a thought in there, a calculation. That's the thing that scares me the most. It was early 1988 when I went on that trek through the Red River Gorge in Kentucky. I love hiking, the quiet of the woods, that sense of isolation from the rest of the world. My name's Rick, Rick Torbett, and I was in my mid-twenties then, just restless energy with nowhere to go. This was gonna be a three-day trip, enough food and some basic camping gear packed neatly in my rucksack. The February weather felt colder than expected, the forecasts predicting light snow showers near the end of my trek. I set off mid-morning, eager to test myself against the challenging terrain of the gorge. The first day was mostly uneventful. The trails were marked well enough, and my seasoned hiker's boots navigated the craggy paths with ease. There's a strange beauty to the bare trees of winter— a kind of stark grace you don't get in other seasons. Late afternoon, I found a suitable place to settle for the night a flat ledge overlooking a ravine. It was still early, so I set up camp and decided to explore the area. That was when I found it. Tucked behind a cluster of boulders was a narrow cave opening, barely big enough to crawl into. Curiosity won over common sense may be the flicker of some long-dormant Indiana Jones fantasy. It looked untouched, undisturbed. Crouched low, I carefully squeezed inside. The interior was surprisingly spacious, light filtering down through a hole high in the ceiling. Musty air hung heavy, and my flashlight illuminated what were clearly old animal bones scattered across the dirt floor. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye a glint in the corner of the cave. Moving closer, I knelt and picked it up. It felt like a piece of a broken beer bottle, the bottom half, the label worn away. Nothing special, just trash someone had left behind. But as I flipped it over in my hand, something seemed off. The glass wasn't frosted like old bottles exposed to the elements. It was perfectly clear, but thicker and heavier than I expected. It looked freshly broken. A flicker of unease snaked down my spine. The animal bones, the litter, it all pointed to someone else being here recently. I shoved the glass shard in my pocket, turned, and made to leave only to freeze. Blocking the cave entrance was an enormous figure. It was hunched over to fit inside. But even so, 
its head brushed the rocky ceiling. The silhouette filled the entire opening, casting me into darkness. My heart jackhammered in my chest. I fumbled for my flashlight, but it was too late. With startling speed, the figure lunged. I barely managed to dive to the side as a massive arm sliced through the air where I had been a split second before. Scrambling to my feet, I spun around, panic clawing at my throat. The thing, man, was a hulking beast, wrapped in shadows, eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. He hissed, a low, guttural sound. His teeth looked impossibly long. The acrid tang of rot washed over me. Whatever this was, it wasn't fully human. He moved toward me, slow, deliberate steps. I stumbled backward until my back hit the cave wall, my pack uselessly pinned behind me. He paused, tilting his massive head in a way that felt almost inquisitive. He didn't look angry, predatory, not even hungry. It was chillingly clinical. I made a desperate decision. Dropping my pack, I sprinted sideways, lunging for the gap between the creature and the cave wall. The creature whirled, but I was faster. My shoulder rammed against his side, throwing him slightly off balance. I squeezed past him, out into the fading daylight. I didn't stop running. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like jelly, stumbling to and fro on the trails. My mind spun in a whirlpool of terror. What was that thing? Wild animal? Some deranged man living feral in the woods? My rational brain refused to accept either explanation. Hours later, I collapsed, gasping, behind a massive tree root. Darkness had fallen and a light snow was beginning, like a veil of white static over the treetops. I was miles from where I'd set up camp. My gear, my food, all of it, gone. I was alone in the freezing wilderness with some monster hunting me. I forced myself to breathe, to think. He wouldn't follow me into the open too exposed, too vulnerable. But I couldn't risk staying put either. The cave had felt like his territory, but out here. I had a slim chance of finding my way back to civilization. I picked a direction, ignoring the trails, scrambling over rocks and brush in a desperate flight from whatever lingered behind me. The woods grew eerily still, the snow muffling every sound. My flashlight beam cut a path through the darkness, snagging on the ghostly outlines of trees. Was he trailing me? Watching? Waiting for the moment I collapsed from exhaustion? I kept moving, fear my fuel. The world narrowed down to the swath of light before me and the ragged rhythm of my own breath. Time blurred. I tripped and fell over and over, scrambling up on raw, throbbing knees, the taste of blood in my mouth. And then I saw it, a sliver of light through the trees, weak and pulsing. Car headlights? A distant farmstead? Hope sparked weakly in my chest. I staggered forwards, the ground rising beneath me. Then I cleared the tree line, breath catching in my throat. It was a road, two thin lines of light from the headlights vanishing into the swirling snow. Civilization. Safety. But what waited behind me, in the encroaching darkness of the woods? I never turned around. I staggered out into the road, waving my arms wildly. A car, thank God, a car was approaching. It slowed, and as the headlights washed over me, the driver's face registered shock. I doubt the driver ever forgot the sight I presented, scraggly beard, torn clothes, eyes wide with a terror he couldn't fully comprehend. I must have been babbling, but he pulled over, helped me into the car. The warmth, the gentle hum of the engine, it all felt surreal after hours of frozen panic. They took me to a small-town police station. 
The cops were kind, but skeptical. My story, a wild-eyed tale of caves and monsters didn't sit well with them. They wrote it off as exhaustion, maybe a touch of exposure. When I insisted something was out there, they patted my shoulder like I was a skittish child. The next day I saw my reflection in a bathroom mirror and didn't recognize myself. Haunted eyes stared back. It wasn't just what I'd seen, but the chilling realization I'd never be able to prove it. That thing in the cave, the world wouldn't believe me. Despite their doubts, the authorities launched a search. They scoured the area where I swore I'd been, but they found nothing. No cave, no creature, certainly no evidence of foul play. They humored me for a few days, even let a reporter interview me for the local paper. Hiker's close encounter in Red River Gorge. The headline blared, the article mocking in its half-hearted skepticism. I knew what I saw. The glass shard in my pocket was proof enough, but proof for who? They told me to go home. It wasn't an option. My old life, my apartment, my job, it felt impossibly alien compared to the raw terror in those woods. I couldn't return to that normalcy, knowing the truth that lurked in the shadows. I became obsessed, a shadow of my former self, poring over maps, wildlife guides, old local legends. Cryptozoology websites I'd once found laughable became my gospel. I had to understand. What was he? A cave troll from Norse myths? My mind latched onto the concept of a Wendigo, those twisted, insatiable spirits of starvation that native legends warned of. It fit, sort of. The gaunt frame, the teeth, that insatiable air about him. Could it be a surviving remnant, somehow adapted to this remote corner of Kentucky? The research was my lifeline, a desperate attempt to make sense of the senseless. I drifted between odd jobs, enough to fund a meager existence and fuel my quest. I'd leave every town with more questions than answers, my eyes darting into every patch of woods, every dark alley. Years rolled by, turning into a decade. My friends, the few I had contact with, told me to move on. Therapists urged me to accept it as trauma, something my mind fabricated to cope. They were wrong. My memory burned too clear, the stink of rot too real for it to be anything but the truth. Then, two months ago, it happened. A small newspaper clipping sent to me anonymously, the corner address smudged beyond recognition. Missing hiker in Yellowstone. It read. The details were chillingly familiar, an abandoned campsite, a lone hiker vanished, and a strange, broken beer bottle found nearby. Authorities suspected animal attack, but nothing was ever found. A fire ignited within me, a mix of grim vindication and dread. I was not the only one. This thing, it was still out there, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and broken lives behind it. And I had the terrifying, vital knowledge of how it might operate, the scraps of information pieced together from my ordeal. It was a hunter, patient, calculating. Caves were its lair, darkness its weapon and those who strayed from the beaten path its prey. I knew because I was one of the few who had escaped. This realization leaves me with a stark choice. Do I try to fade into the normalcy everyone expects of me, living under the crushing weight of what I know? Or do I become something new, a hunter in my own right, armed with the knowledge that may keep others from disappearing into the shadows? The answers aren't easy. The world is vast, and I'm one man, haunted and ill-equipped to fight a creature that exists on the fringes of our understanding. But then I remember him, his glowing eyes in the cave, the calculating tilt of his head. I remember the driver's face as I stumbled into the road, the way the world keeps turning, oblivious to the darkness lurking at its edges. 
Maybe I am crazy, a man broken by trauma as the therapist said. Or perhaps, I am the only one who sees the cracks in the world, the only one with the terrible knowledge of what crawls through them. That glass shard burns in my pocket, a reminder of a truth far more monstrous than any wilderness can hold. And in that twisted way, it's the only thing that feels real anymore. The drive to Glacier National Park in 1997 should have been a dream come true. Me, fresh out of college, itching to see something beyond the rolling green hills of my native Kentucky. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt Caldwell, and if anyone asked why I was headed to Montana alone with just a backpack and a beat-up tent, it was simple. Sometimes a man needs some wide-open space for his head. The first few days were a hiker's paradise. Trails snaked through forests thick with pine, waterfalls tumbled from sheer cliffs, the kind of postcard views that make you believe in a higher power. Even the solitude, which I'd been craving, felt good for my soul. Maybe it was that sense of peace that made me drop my guard, take a detour off the main path. That's when I saw it a narrow fissure in a cliff face, barely visible beneath a canopy of pine branches. It pulled at me, the promise of the unexplored. Leaving my pack propped against a tree, I ventured in. The opening was tight, forcing me to crawl on my belly, the rough rock scraping against me. I should have turned back. My dad's voice, always the cautious type, echoed in my mind. But that same stubbornness that got me into trouble as a kid propelled me forward. I squeezed into a slightly wider chamber, the stale air heavy despite a faint crack of sunlight from somewhere above. Then I stumbled on them, bones. Not animal bones, I knew that much from my Boy Scout days. Human. Dozens of them scattered across the floor. A chill swept through me, fear prickling the back of my neck. This was no ancient burial site. Nothing about it felt old. As if on cue, my foot kicked something hard. I looked down to see a weathered wallet half buried in the dirt. It was faded leather with a Wyoming driver's license inside. The face on the card, smiling wide under a ten-gallon hat, belonged to a man named Ethan Cole. The license was issued in 1994, just three years prior. It hit me then, a wave of nausea washing over me. This place wasn't a discovery, it was a tomb. These people weren't long-lost pioneers, they were recent. And whatever put those bones here could still be lurking nearby. Hey! Anyone there? I called out, my voice echoing eerily in the cavern. No reply. I thought of Ethan Cole, the picture of the guy frozen on that plastic card. Was that his skull lying there in the dirt? Had his big, sunny smile been the last thing, whatever it was had seen? Scrambling backwards, I hit my head hard on the rock, stars exploding in my vision. The cavern spun, the walls closing in. For a panic second, all I could think was, Asterisk, this is how it ends. Stupid college kid plays explorer, gets himself eaten in some nameless cave. Asterisk, then something shifted in the shadows, a flicker of movement in the far corner. With a jolt of adrenaline, I scrambled to my feet, my flashlight beam cutting into the darkness. What I saw made my blood freeze. There, crouched low, was a massive figure, Humanoid yet, wrong. Its body was impossibly thin, ribs protruding through tight, leathery skin. Its head was too large, the jaw jutting out unnaturally, a mess of mangled teeth bared in what was either a snarl or a gruesome grin. But it was the eyes that chilled me to the core, vacant, inky black, glinting with a hungry intelligence. He lunged. 
Time seemed to stretch out, my body moving in slow motion as I stumbled back, my scream caught in my throat. He was inhumanly fast, his long, clawed fingers slashing at my face. Get out of here! Stay away! I yelled, grabbing the only thing within reach, Ethan's dusty wallet. I hurled it at the creature with all my strength. It shrieked, the sound a mix of rage and surprise, momentarily distracted by the object. That bought me precious seconds. Turning, I scrambled madly for the cave entrance, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. Branches whipped at my face, the rough bark raking my skin, but I didn't stop. I burst into the blinding sunlight gasping for air. Then, without hesitating, I ran. Through the trees, across meadows, I ran till my lungs burned and my legs felt like they'd give out. The forest was a blur of green and brown, but I sensed him behind me, the rustle of leaves, the cracking of branches under his unnatural weight. I stumbled out onto a narrow cliffside path and froze. Below, a waterfall cascaded into a rocky chasm, the roar of the water filling my ears. It was a dead end. Behind me, the sound of his approach grew louder, closer. There were no more trees to hide behind, nowhere to run. With trembling hands, I drew the hunting knife my dad had given me, knowing deep down how useless it would be against the monster that emerged from the shadows. The creature stalked toward me, steps echoing in the sudden silence. Every inch of me screamed to fight, but a deeper animal instinct told me this was beyond fighting. This was survival, pure and unforgiving. It tilted its head, those inky eyes calculating. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs, my breaths coming in sharp, shuddering bursts. Then it did something I hadn't expected. It paused, its gaze snagging on something behind me. For a heart-stopping moment, it almost looked confused. I whipped around, following its gaze, and almost tripped in shock. Two figures stood on the path, a young couple, wide-eyed and frozen in a mix of terror and awe. A surge of desperation washed over me. Run! I screamed. It's coming for you. Run! They didn't move. Their eyes were fixated on the creature, as if held in some macabre trance. Pure, undiluted horror rippled through me. These two, they were doomed. They were going to die because of my stupid detour, my recklessness. The creature hissed, the sound slicing through the air. It lunged, moving not for me, but for them. The man tried to react, shoving the woman behind him but he was too slow. The creature's emaciated hand snaked out, fingers like hooks closing around the man's neck. There was a sickening crack as it hauled him effortlessly toward the precipice. Suddenly, the woman shrieked, a piercing sound that snapped through my fear like a whip. It seemed to break the spell over both creature and victim. The creature paused, shifting its attention to her. The man in its grip clawed frantically at the bony fingers, gasping for air as his legs dangled over the cliff's edge. That moment of hesitation was all I needed. In three desperate strides I was next to them, my hunting knife raised. I wasn't aiming to kill the creature the futility of that was obvious. But I needed a distraction, a chance. Screaming a wordless battle cry, I slashed at the creature's arm with all my strength. The blade sliced through the leathery skin, but to my horror, it didn't flinch. Its empty eyes fixed on me, and for a frozen second, I knew it had made a choice. Ignoring the struggling man, it turned its twisted grin on me. I jumped backward, barely dodging the clawed hand that reached for my throat. Without another thought, I hurled myself towards the woman. I hit her hard, sending us both tumbling away from the edge, rolling down a steep slope. 
crashes echoed behind us, the sickening thud of flesh hitting rock followed by a final, fading scream. I scrambled to my feet, half dragging, half carrying the woman further from the cliff edge. My heart pounded in my ears, a desperate rhythm drowning out her soft sobs. It didn't follow. For whatever reason, it had stayed by the cliff, its guttural growls echoing after us as we crashed through the underbrush, further and further into the trees. Hours later, dehydrated and scraped up, we reached a service road, flagging down a passing car. The park rangers arrived, then the police, the paramedics. I told them everything, my voice shaking, about the cave, the bones, the creature that hunted in the shadows. The woman beside me sobbed into her hands, her face a mask of traumatized shock. As expected, the search party turned up nothing at the cliff's edge. No sign of the creature, no body. The prevailing theory became that the man had been hallucinating, perhaps under the influence of something, and had tragically jumped, either alone or accidentally dragging the woman with him. That's what went into the official reports of Freak Incident, a cautionary tale of the perils of the wilderness. I was labeled the brave hiker who helped save a victim, lauded for quick thinking. Even Ethan Cole's bones were discovered in the cave, his family finally getting closure after years of uncertainty. No amount of closure changed the truth I saw. The creature was still out there, a dark stain on the edge of a place I once saw as nature's sanctuary. I left Glacier, returning home, but the peace I craved never came. I became a man obsessed, haunted by black eyes and skeletal forms. Therapists whispered PTSD, but my nightmares were far too vivid, too disturbingly real. News trickles in occasionally. A hiker mysteriously vanishing a body discovered torn to shreds in the remote backwoods, the cause of death forever labeled, animal attack. These incidents are scattered, seemingly random, but I know better. The creature thrives in that liminal space, between rumor and reality, its existence doubted by the wider world. And maybe that's what keeps the rest of you safe, ignorance. As for me, I've traded the wilderness for urban landscapes, the anonymity of a faceless crowd. My backpack gathers dust, a reminder of the naive kid who thought exploring meant conquering. I've learned that the real monsters don't need claws or fangs. Sometimes they lurk in our blind spots, hidden within the shadows we ourselves cast. They thrive because we refuse to accept that some darkness cannot be illuminated, no matter how brightly we shine our flashlights into the abyss. Some reckonings don't come with a neat ending, with answers or absolution. They simply are, a chilling whisper on the wind, a shadow that falls just a little too long. Maybe, just maybe, it's some kind of twisted mercy that the world sees me as a bit broken, a guy who stares too long at the shadows. Because if they saw what I really saw, they might realize just how fragile the veil between the known and the unknown truly is. They might understand that some monsters are real, even if we don't dare speak their names.